in 30. Okay, members, you're welcome to the uh, meeting of the Justice Committee. If members can do the needful with any electronic uh, devices, and if members are agreed, then the oral evidence sessions will be reported by Hansard. Agreed. Um, again, just at this stage, um, any declarations of financial or other relevant interests, which might reasonably be thought by others to influence their approach to any matter under consideration, now is the time uh, to declare it. If not, then we shall move on. Uh, there's apologies from Doug Beattie and Emma Rogan. And we have three members that are using the teleconference facility. Um, Paul Frew, Sinead Bradley and Gemma Dolan. And at this point, if I can welcome, um, albeit remotely, Sinead Bradley to the uh, Committee for Justice. And uh, Sinead has provided an entry into the Register of Members' Interests. And that's in uh, page four of your uh, table pack. So, Sinead, you're, you're very welcome to the Justice Committee. Thank you very much, Chair. Patsy McGlone, members, um, move to the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee. And I just want to place on my record my thanks to Patsy. Um, he served in this committee for many years. Um, I served with him for uh, a lengthy period, um, as other colleagues have. And he always had a, a very useful and valuable contribution that he made to this committee. And I just want to place on record my appreciation um, for his contribution. Um, at this stage, I'll invite the clerk to indicate if any members have delegated their vote as per the relevant standing order. Okay, under uh, standing order 1156, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Dylan. Okay. Um, the draft minutes of the meeting then that was held on the 14th of May, um, pages 5 to 11 of the meeting pack. Um, if you're content that they're a true reflection of that meeting, then I can uh, sign them. Agreed. 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 Yeah. Um, some matters are rising. Um, item 1, Legislative Consent Motion for the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill. At our meeting on the 14th of May, uh, we considered a written briefing on the proposed LCM. Uh, in respect of that issue, we agreed that an oral briefing by officials was not uh, necessary. The LCM was laid by the Department of Justice on the 15th of May, and to enable the debate to take place on the 9th of June and to meet the Westminster timetable, the memorandum was circulated on the 19th of May, and members were asked to confirm if they were content with the proposals to extend the provisions in the LCM, which relates to the creation of a new offence that prohibits the unauthorised sale or resale of games tickets uh, to enable a draft report to be prepared for consideration at the meeting today. The majority of the members confirmed that they were content um, with the proposed LCM. Uh, one member had asked for some further information in respect of enforcement um, for the new offence and arrangements for the, le the legitimate reselling of tickets, and a copy of that response from the Department of Justice is found <coughs> in uh, your table pack. So if members um, are content, I just need to formally um, put the question to the committee to agree the LCM, and so that can be included in the draft report, and then we'll consider it later in the meeting. Okay. Good. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Item two then um, was an update from the department uh, to do with the oral briefing session on the budget and finance. Um, the meeting pack has the relevant correspondence, pages 33 and 34. The department provided an update on the information uh, to be sent to the committee on the department's finance and budget position prior to the oral evidence session that's scheduled for that meeting. The Department has advised that the Department of Finance has now indicated that the June monitoring round returns are due for the 12th of June rather than the 5th of June, along with returns on an additional exercise to review existing pressures and consider the reprioritisation of budgets to help address the emerging COVID-19 pressures. Officials have said that they're um, happy, um, maybe not happy, but uh, and they'll be happy to come back to the committee with more information on the exercises. Uh, due on the 12th of June, if the committee will find that necessary. Um, so if members are content, we'll note that information. We'll proceed with the evidence session that was planned on the 4th of June. Following that, if we need to have a further one, um, there's time permitting to allow that. Okay, um, item three on the matters arising, the debate on the LCM on sentencing bill is listed for the order paper on the 2nd of June. Indicative timing is at 10.35 a.m. Um, 
Okay, we'll move into item four on the agenda now, um, which is to receive the COVID-19 responses from the different organisations. Um, as per previous meeting, uh, we'll take them in turn. We'll have the, the police service uh, first, then we're going to have the prison service and uh, the court service and its planned members um, to spend half an hour um, on each session. Um, so once we get opening comments, um, we'll open it up to members uh, to raise some questions. So can I um, formally welcome Alan Todd, the Assistant Chief Constable um, for District Policing and the Coronavirus Planning um, Operation within the uh, Police Service of Northern Ireland. Again, you're very welcome to the meeting and it will be recorded by Hansard and then published in uh, due course. So, Alan, at this stage, I'll hand over to you to make some opening remarks, and then if you're content, we'll move into to questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, folks. Um, so, um, in terms of general policing terms, uh, the crime trend continues to be lower than it has previously uh, prior to the 23rd of March, which is sort of notified as the as the restriction period for, for COVID. Um, but that gap is narrowing. Um, originally, the gap between um, average recorded crimes. Uh, and the recorded crimes during the COVID period was about 35 or 40 per cent reduction, and generally across all crime types, with the notable exception uh, of domestic abuse, which I know has been discussed with committee members previously. Uh, as of last week, that gap has narrowed to something less than 20 per cent, um, and again, that's across all crime types. So whilst, whilst it means that across the period from 23rd of March to now, you're seeing an, an overall crime reduction about 35-37 per cent across all crime types. There are obviously variations between those. Uh, for instance, shoplifting can be down as much as 75 or 80 per cent for reasons which I won't need to explain to the committee. Um, uh, others will be down less, but that, that sort of 35 to 40 per cent trend is the average. But the gap has closed. Uh, last week uh, has been the closest gap over the period, and of course. Members won't need a real explanation around that as more people are out doing more things and, and there is a degree of normalisation returning to society than some of the uh, some of the less attractive sides of society then return to more normal levels as well. Uh, and we're certainly seeing that on the crime recording uh, and antisocial behaviour recording side. Still a reduction, but that gap is narrowing and we would anticipate that that trend will continue over time. Um, I think that then leads me into, uh, you know, on the back of the Chief Constable's statement with the First Minister and Deputy First Minister at the press conference last Friday, um, around the, the policing, the changing of emphasis is changing from policing a COVID crisis to, uh, and fighting the virus to policing a more normal environment and fighting crime. And that's a, it's never a one thing or the other, it's just a change in emphasis. Uh, and certainly the language that we're using inside the police service, that I've, I'm moving from policing a COVID crisis to delivering policing in a COVID environment, uh, which means we'll keep some of the things that we're, we're doing, which I think are good practice. So we will keep things like the custody arrangements. You may have seen the, the press coverage around our COVID-specific custody suites and how we provide for the safety of detained persons, staff, and legal profession and others that are involved in that. Uh, so we'll be retaining that in, in the medium term in anticipation that, we'll, that COVID will be with us in the medium term. Uh, we'll be continuing with dedicated, equipped uh, COVID crews on a district basis because, again, we think that's going to be a necessity to deliver policing services in the round across districts for the medium term. Um, but that will have to be on top of uh, a return to policing uh, within that COVID uh, arrangement where their more traditional and more normal demands also start to emerge. So um, my role at this stage has very much moved from that initial eight-week period of a crisis management plan, much more into the recovery phase, which is about rebalancing the organisation back closer to what it looked like previously with some additional demand placed upon it uh, and how, how we configure ourselves from that. And then, like any other organisation, how we configure safety in the workplace with social distancing, with working practices, with business practices. Because some of the services at the police service haven't been prioritising and haven't been delivering in terms of backroom support and administrative functions, which have been downscaled in recent weeks, will need to be built back up again in anticipation as other services around us, including courts and others, start to return to normal. So that, it's, a, it's a balance and nuance change. Um, um, but that's, that's a change that we're currently undertaking. Um, to be more specific around the COVID piece in itself, um, 
that moving policing a COVID crisis to policing in a COVID environment will also see a change in emphasis that police place on policing the current health protection restrictions. Those restrictions themselves have been relaxed. Uh, I think as you relax restrictions, you move from uh, a model which has an emphasis on enforcement and therefore an emphasis on policing to a model that has an emphasis on common sense, public trust and public responsibility, which is less a place for policing and more a place for, for good citizenry. The police will have a role to play around that, but not perhaps in the centre of it, as would have been previously. And therefore, you'll see our role and our emphasis changing uh, in, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, and, I, and I see that reflect. This is not just a PSNI position. This is a national policing uh, position. And I see coverage in the Times today from the head of the National Police Chiefs Council, Martin Hewitt, articulating just such a, a position right across UK policing. And then certainly, we're seeing a similar transition in my uh, regular conversations with my opposite number, no Garda Shea Connor. So this is a, a broad approach for policing. Um, I think uh, we need to be careful about our language and our interpretation of that. Uh, the, the paper that I read this morning defined that as a police are retreating from their enforcement role. Uh, I think that's unfortunate. I think it's inaccurate. I think it's unfair. Uh, you have to, you have to think, have to accept that as, as legislators, loosen legislation and loosen the requirements, there will be less policing of it. Uh, and I think the two go hand in hand and not separate each other. Um, but that's certainly a direction of travel that we'll be developing going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, and just for, as you said at the start, with three members that are on the teleconference, Sinead Bradley, Paul Frew, um, and Gemma Dolan. Um, just to pick up then on a, on a couple of those points, and I think you've, you've articulated them well in terms of the movement, because obviously at the start, whenever you're very you know, constrained restrictions in place, in one respect, it's easier to enforce because it's very clear what they are. Um, and as that is relaxed, as you say, then that becomes a lot more difficult um, and you move into that good citizenry and common sense and, and having to do that. So I suppose it's... It's where do you strike that balance um, in terms of your enforcement role <coughs> whenever then you're interacting with the public who some in, in, in acting in good faith don't believe that they've broken any regulation and it's that kind of subjective interpretation that the public may have and, and what your officers will, will ultimately be able to discern. That can create a tension. And, and it can also then have an impact on wider confidence in policing if, if the public feel that I've done nothing wrong, albeit unknowingly, and you're having to police all of that. So I suppose I'd like you just to elaborate a little bit more as to how you're going to walk that line of policing in a more relaxed regime and dealing with the public who feel that they're, they're acting in good faith and using common sense, even though that may not be on the face of it when it comes to looking, strictly speaking, at the regulations? No, uh, no I absolutely understand that uh, and certainly identify with some of the points you raised, Chair. The, um, of course, it's, it's all these things are a journey with new and short-term regulations. It's, it's very rarely we deal with these circumstances in any real in any real terms. So a lot of this is new and if you sort of chart that journey, um, there, was, there was a lead into the restrictions becoming law uh, where people were being told what to expect but there was no enforcement around that. And then the, re the restrictions came in, and I think police in good faith didn't move immediately to an enforcement of the new regulations on the 23rd of March. I had a conversation here that said for the first week, 10 days, fortnight, uh, that we would seek to use that en uh, engage, explain encouragement without the fourth day of the enforcement. And that's what we did for the first 10 days or so. I think there was a strong feeling heading into the Easter weekend uh, that probably because the regulations were new and they weren't really being enforced in any major way that uh, people started to not comply with them which led to a tightening uh, and enforcement approach which led to a significant level of fixed penalty notices and community resolution notices being issued um, from Easter weekend through the preceding two or three weeks after that. I think as that proceeded uh, as police got more comfortable with the regulations, as the public became more comfortable with it, with people became more comfortable that actually there were going to be enforcement and, and, they, and they needed to comply, then you can see the enforcement was tailing off. Um, then we've gone to the, the first phases of the stage one in the executive recovery plan, which allows people to do more things, more places, more of the time, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and that, an anticipation that that will continue to be the pathway. Uh, what, what you will have seen from policing uh, is a move back to the three E's rather than the four E's. Um, 
uh, with that, that enforcement piece been eased back again, which was which I said in my introduction. Now, um, does it cause uh, any? Does the current situation cause any real difficulty for policing? Um, not particularly, um, because Regulation Five, which deals with the restriction of movement, now has a whole raft of defined exceptions, um, and. To the, to the extent where it can really only operate as a public trust model, uh, uh, and it would be unfair to ask police to police the restriction of movement uh, measures in any meaningful way, uh, except in extremists or where there's been a blatant disregard. Uh, and the practical outworkings of that is that we're not conducting the road checks that we were, we're not stopping the people that we were, because there are so many exceptions to the restrictions of movement or the Regulation 5 that, it ha that you have to trust people to do the right thing. Mm -hmm because there are so many exceptions that it's, a, it's not a good use of either time or public confidence in, in engaging in that part of the operation, which we would have been quite strong on in the early stages for all the obvious reasons. But now uh, legislation has eased that to a point where it has to be a trust model uh, and not an enforcement, an enforcement and compliance model. Uh, and, and that's something for legislators to review the impact of going forward. Regulation 6, which is the gatherings piece, I think will be the place that, that policing will continue to identify a need for enforcement. Um, there are there are no powers within the the, the legislation per se um, to for police to enforce social distancing. So um, whilst people may think police officers are going about with two metre measuring sticks, uh, yes. that's not in the legislation. That's not in our plan, nor indeed in our mindset. Yeah. So I, I can put people's mind at ease around that. But we are where we are where we are seeing or where we see large gatherings of people <coughs> not socially distancing and breach of regulation six. I think that will become the enforcement space uh, until such times as that too becomes a space in legislation where it moves from enforcement to trust. Yeah. Well, I, I, I've made the point before that placing our way out of these regulations isn't going to be effective sure. because it just is not possible to have the police carrying out the kind of role that the regulations, if you were to do it 100% consistently and all the rest of it, it's, it's just not, it's not possible and that's where you have to trust the public. But I think you've caveated that very well, that where there is a blatant disregard, that's still going to be enforced and policed, you know, but the message still needs to go out that people need to exercise their own common sense and take decisions that you know, aren't going to put people at unnecessary risks. And, and for me, the challenge is joining that policing approach up with central messaging uh, from the executive, from uh, health authorities and others, um, as, to, you know, as to what the clear message is that you want the public to understand, because the trust model will only work where there's clear messaging that makes sense to the public and, and they feel that that's a good thing to do and makes sense to do it. And policing fits best into that model. Uh, where, where we do have and had stresses and strains before is where there are disjointed places between the intention of the regulation, the messaging going out and what we're being asked to police. Um, and because people ha look in different directions and see different explanations. Uh, and actually a trust model, I think the messaging becomes even more important. Um, you know, and, uh, I know there, there was some intention, some discussion about the relaxation regulations asking people to stay local, um, but actually the outworkings of the regulations and from what I see uh, from the, the wider public behaviour at the minute, that's, that's not what's landing out on, on, on the roads and, and the streets uh, around Northern Ireland. But uh, we've taken cognizance of that in our policing approach and saying, well, you know, we, it's not a space for us to get involved in. Okay. Um, just a factual more question at the start of this, the sick leave within the place as a result of the COVID-19, is there an updated picture as to what were, I think it was initially 10 or 11 percent? So as of this morning on the police officer side of the organisation, I think we're sitting at about 92 percent availability, so about 8 percent absence, and that's a combined absence number. Not, that's, that's not just down to COVID, that's just an organisational number. Uh, and on the staff side, about 89%. So those are really healthy in terms of, uh, of, of national averages because I get a national comparison on a daily basis. And we're, we're sitting in the, probably in the top half of, of, of comparators across the UK uh, and broadly aligned with our colleagues in Angora Shikana. So that, that's a healthy space, uh, of course. Um, I don't think we should be complacent around that, Chair. Um, you know, it's, it's for health professionals, Chief Scientific Advisor and Chief Medical Officer to advise us on the potential for the... Uh, for the, the R rate to go up or down, what the impact would be in the organisation, the impact of track, trace and isolate, for instance, uh, coming into the summer season, with the impact of quarantine arrangements for anybody travelling. All those things we have to keep a wary eye on to, to make sure we, can, we protect our organisational capability to deliver services. And the, uh, the, trainee, the trainees, the recruits that were coming through, um, how, how have you found that in terms of the outworking of the, the changes to that process? 
Well, the significant amount of work has gone in at the college with student officers to, to reduce class sizes, to, to deliver distance training, uh, to uh, increase social distancing right across. So uh, we've not, we're not running at, uh, at the same capacity we were for some of those reasons, but we've been pretty successful in reshaping our service delivery and our training delivery uh, away from some of the stuff that we traditionally do in service to protect the student officer program at the front end, because that, that builds into there are people leaving the organisation through retirement, through other reasons, uh, and we need to make sure that we're not making short-term decisions now about shutting down student officer training that would have long-term tails in terms of our operational capability uh, and the chief and the policing board's desire to see those numbers grow. And what was there officers that um, postponed their planned retirement? I think there was a call that was put out for people to consider that? There, there was a national call uh, put out at the time for people to consider that. It's something we haven't done on, on a major way. Of course, individual cho people uh, will make individual choices on their, on their own circumstances. So we've not, uh, that hasn't been a big number of people for us. Some people have chosen not to retire because maybe the cruises that were booked or anything else uh, aren't, you know, so everybody will have their own personal uh, reasons and, and explanations around that, but we've not seen a, a significant shift in that trend. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Linda Dillon. Yeah, things. Um, just a couple of wee questions, obviously, around the domestic abuse stuff, first of all. Just, we know that there is an increase in a in number of incidents. Is is there any, have you any figures around that, first of all, but is there any change in the type of incident? And um, how, have you found that there are an increased number of referrals to organisations like Women's Aid, the Men's advisory project um, La Dolce Vita and Derry those organisations because some of them are saying that they're a wee bit concerned that they aren't getting the numbers of people that will correlate with the figures that are coming through and they're worried that in the aftermath of, of Covid there's going to be an avalanche of stuff coming at them because people are in this space not coming to them but they're going to have to at some point so we're just trying to make sure that, that we can have them so prepared for that I think that conversation reflects our nervousness around what the unknowns unknown the unknown unknowns are. Uh, there are there are just things we have a sense that mightn't be right, and that some reporting mightn't be happening for a range of circumstances. But our conversation with our um, third sector partners and others, uh, we're, we're all sort of, we all probably expected to see more than we're currently seeing. So as of last week, uh, domestic abuse reported incidents of police in terms of crime was broadly in line with the average for this week last year. Now, that everything else is down, but we sort of expect, and it has, and, and, and others have given explanations to this committee that some of the, at times that reporting level has been significantly above uh, the weekly trend average. But last week it was broadly in line with that. Um, now, whether that reflects some easing of the regulations and people are able to get out of the home more and there's more things to get out to do and maybe that has eased some of the, the stresses in the domestic situation, I suspect, uh, academic research and other research over time will give us the answers looking backwards, um, but it's quite, it's, it's a little difficult to understand all the nuances of it uh, in the current space looking forward. Um, but you know, it, on one level, it's a good news story for us that we aren't continuing to see significant levels above the normal, um, not, notwithstanding that the levels are too high in any case, uh, but we're not seeing that huge increase that we might have anticipated uh, above the trend. Um, that is borne out by incident reporting in place, it's borne out by the crime conversion rate of that in place, and it's borne out by our conversations with our other partners in this space. Whether that turns out to be the true picture going forward, looking backwards, I don't think any of us are in a position to, to, to make a judgment on. But neither do we get the sense that, um, that there are service delivery shortcomings either by police or partners that, that are, are short selling people in that space. So um, I think there's some degree of comfort from where we are, uh, and from, uh, from a lot of the work that's been done proactively, um, but I don't think we'll fully understand the picture until we're further on. Okay, I appreciate it. Can I just yes. another question? Yeah. Um, you talked a wee bit there, Alan, just around, obviously, that you're sort of transitioning from COVID policing to policing in a, in a COVID space and trying to normalise, want of a, a, a better word. I'm just wondering, obviously, there was a, a quite a bit of work going on around creating the neighbourhood policing team and getting that focus back on community um, policing. And I think even what you've said around you're moving from the space of where it can be placed, and I think the Chair is 100% right in that, it can't be placed because it has to be about 
community and individuals take an individual responsibility to do the right thing as far as possible. And my kind of approach to this is if everybody does as much right as they can, then that's that's a good place to be in because everybody won't do the perfect thing all of the time. And that's just the nature of, of human beings. But in terms of moving forward, I think that <coughs> neighbourhood policing teams, getting those in place, that community policing and community engagement, even though it'll be in a different way, obviously, to what we might have thought or might have planned, is even more important because you are going to want the community to work with you and do the right thing rather than having to try to, to police it. And I think that's as much on the side of people who would be making complaints as it is those who would be being complained about so that the, the public understand why the police take the role they do or, or, or take the position they do because obviously there are people who have a very hard and fast, you know, there's seven people in that garden. I want the police to come out and put one of them out of the garden. And that's, that's very difficult. And, and I think that the community needs to understand, you know, the police position in relation to this. And for that reason, I think community policing, neighbourhood policing teams is more important than ever. And I'm just wondering where we're at now in terms of moving forward how, of putting that in place. Well, I can give you good news on that because um, I think we both we're, we're, all, we're in the same space around this. Um, so, as part of our uh, recovery and, and, and normalisation process, um, the decision was made last week uh, to move towards uh, returning neighbourhood police officers to, to their local <coughs> teams. Um, now, we all, we always leave a number of weeks for that just to work through because that involves people's shifts changing their days off, changing their childcare arrangements, their domestic arrangements. It, you can't really decide that on a Wednesday and do it on a Thursday. Uh, but we did take the decision last week, and it's my anticipation uh, that within the next couple of weeks, uh, the majority of neighbourhood police officers will have been returned to local neighbourhood teams. Uh, there may be a smaller number that takes it a little while longer to return because some of those officers <coughs> are in COVID protection crews and others, and we're just rotating some of that through and, and, and moving people about the organisation. But the decision has been made to do it. Some people will have, ha will have already started to revert to neighbourhood duties, uh, and the majority of, of the neighbourhood officers will move towards that space uh, in the coming two weeks. Uh, and uh, if, if we're having this conversation again in a month's time, I expect that to be largely completed. Uh, but uh, those neighbourhood teams will, will, in effect, be back and working and effectively working in their districts within weeks. Just one last comment, and, and it's a comment rather than a, a question. Um, I think that, and I've said this to you the last time you were here, I think that broadly the police have taken the right approach. In relation to this, and I know there may be individuals that have had some issues, but broadly, and I, and I can speak in my own area, I do you think that the police have taken the right approach? And we do appreciate that you were working in difficult circumstances. And I actually was in a circumstance yesterday where somebody was um, not well, and two police officers mm -hmm. were dealing with them. And I think that given the circumstances, that people have done their best, and no more can be asked of them. So. I think if we take that approach moving forward, it is important. And where people have said to me, I don't think the police are coming down hard enough, I have been straight with them and said, well, we're asking them not to, to try and work with people first and foremost, and where enforcement then is, is required, that that's where you, where you move to. And I think it is the right approach. And it's, I think, will feed in better then to people acting responsibly, where they don't feel that they're being forced to, but they're, they're responsible enough to do the right thing themselves. Thank you. I think moving forward, that is hopefully going to work for us again. Not everybody will do the right thing, that's just like. Okay, thank you, Linda. Gordon? Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks, Alan, for your presentation and update. Yeah, I think we would uh, reinforce what has been said about the return to community policing. And certainly in our North Down area, we appreciate the work that has been done uh, well with the COVID teams, which we are very much aware of and also the community policing efforts. We, we've seen the evidence there, and I think we've mentioned it before, that, that there were great, great strides have been made in, in rebuilding the community policing. So we look forward to that happening again. We welcome it, and it, it is so important. As Again, as in areas like North Town, we're going to get uh, an increase in numbers of people especially along the, the coastal path areas and, and the various districts throughout throughout the whole area. And we need there needs to be a balance of how police are going to manage that. 
I think there is fear from locals that you know crowds will will increase the risk again uh, in relation to COVID, and how is that going to be managed? Managed, I appreciate in a, in a much softer way, but I think I would appreciate that there will be some monitoring. I think would be a good term in relation to um, how those crowds or potential crowds can be controlled in in the future. Uh, that, that's my first point. My second one is in relation to funerals, uh, family funerals, really. Um, have this. Uh, I've been at two funerals uh, within my own constituency. Both actually were from were former elected representatives. Both were held from funeral parlours. Uh, at one there was about twelve people, and the second one there was about a hundred people. Now, um, I thought. And the funeral parlour, the, the uh, cortege left the funeral parlour, went, went down through the town, and um, there was 12 people outside one, and the other we had probably about 100 people. The second one, I was involved a bit with the police, and we got some advice, and the police were reasonable, but reinforced the, the law, I suppose, to all of us, that you know you, you cannot uh, follow the, the, the hearse in, in a cortege but people can assemble in the street. And that was done. The people, everybody acted responsibly and stayed at two metres and um, there were no issues. But my point is that the public out there are confused about this issue. And a lot of people, especially in Northern Ireland, uh, still very much respect funerals and respect the dead. And I think it's something that people uh, feel deeply about. And what I would like is just your opinion. Is it time to review that? I know it's not entirely in your hands. I fully appreciate that, but the police are uh, in, are involved in, in in the whole management of it and the re, in the review of it. But I do think it's time something was done in, in relation to clarifying it because there's a lot of disappointment and there's a lot of fear that people just cannot attend. They almost feel they could be arrested in the street. We're going to a funeral, and I feel that is wrong, and I think we need to review it and move on on that. Um, I think you're right, Gordon. Uh, funerals are a hugely emotive uh, and emotionally sensitive time for everybody involved, and um, there's been a lot of public discourse from a whole lot of angles about about funerals. Um, the, the police service haven't taken; you know, it's not for us to take a view. Um, you know what's permissible or not, and, and what's guidance or not, is a matter for the legislators and for the executive. Uh, and I know in your conversation with the Attorney General uh, at this committee a couple of weeks ago, yeah. you talked about you know ten had seemed to be the settled number. The police have never said it was ten. It's not our job to do so. Uh, that that was discussed in guidance, which I think was actually informal guidance. So police are generally operating in a space where there's no legislation, not a lot of guidance and trying to apply some common sense about a successful outcome. Um, and I know from a whole, from talking to public representatives such as yourself, from talking to funeral directors, uh, yeah, which I've yeah. done, from talking to clergy, uh, from all denominations, on, on, this is fraught with challenge. And what we've been trying to do, as you might expect, in, in terms of our approach, is to be sensitive to all the dynamics in play in, in a funeral space. Bearing in mind that if you, all, if you opt to go to an enforcement or a police enforcement approach to a funeral, you're probably going to end up hands on streets with mourners. And I'm not sure any of us thinks that's a good idea in terms of an outcome. Uh, so our approach in policing is that we will engage with families. Um, now, you know, obviously, there's lots of funerals uh, in lots of places every day. But where we have a sense that somebody has a, st a status in their community or is likely to have a following or there's likely to be a big crowd, we will absolutely talk to families. Mm -hmm. We'll talk to the clergy involved uh, in, in the services uh, and, and anybody responsible for the churches. Uh, and we will talk to the funeral directors and we'll try and get a sense of how that's being managed and look for reassurances that that dynamic of family, church and funeral directors is sufficient to bring about uh, an acceptable outcome in, in, in the spirit of the health protection regulations. Um, and that has been our approach. Now, there have been occasions when people have given those assurances only to make other arrangements not known to the funeral director, sometimes not known to the family, and certainly sometimes not known to the church. Uh, so that doesn't always hold together. We have been in situations where we've been forced into a choice of 
do we physically intervene at short notice in, in a funeral in the middle of a cortege or people attending a funeral? Or do we merely seek to try and gather some evidence that may then bring people before the courts in due course if we feel they've breached the regulations? That's a difficult space and there's, there's decisions to be made in there. That has been our approach. Um, but uh, policing, do, I, I haven't issued guidelines to officers around funerals because there are no guidelines uh, issuing from the people who laid the regulations. Um, and, and it is one of those things. This, this rule of 10 has been floating about, and I know you quoted the Attorney General. And, Mm. He he had a view on, um, on, and, and very much in line with the policing approach about trying to keep to the spirit of the generality of it. You know, if you've gone back to the ver to the original regulations when they were laid at first, it do it doesn't in terms of gatherings, it doesn't specify any number of people who may attend a funeral. One one of the exceptions to a gathering is a funeral. What Regulation Five did was to say you can't travel to a funeral unless you are a close family member or a friend in the absence of their being close family members, which is quite restrictive. And then police are going, well, 100 people have turned up and they're not committing any offence under Regulation 6 because of the funeral, but they shouldn't have been travelling under Regulation 5. And, and you can see the difficulties in trying to make some decisions around enforcement around that. As I said earlier, with the relaxations in Regulation 5, um, with social distancing, with responsible behaviour, that's not a space that people are going to get, or police are going to get involved in. Um, so, how funerals are conducted, and if there's to be any further guidance or rules or whatever, will have to come from uh, the legislators and from the assembly. Uh, in the meantime, police will continue to apply our principles about engaging with families and churches and, and providers uh, to try and get a sense that that looks like something that is sensible and safe within the, within the spirit of the, of the health protection regulations and advise people to their arrangements if we feel that it's not. And if we feel that people go ahead and breach that, then we have, we have uh, some decision to make as a service around the level uh, and timing of any enforcement or any follow-up action around that. And that has been our approach to date and will continue to be the approach going forward. Yeah, thanks for that. But um, I do think the regulations were designed for the extreme circumstances that thankfully did not materialise, you know, where there would have been high risk and high volume of deaths, which I think I do think that they do need re reviewed. And I must say, to be fair, the police I suppose laid down the, the law and in brackets to to the those involved, but at the end of the day common sense did prevail and there were no issues. But I think there is that very negative um, message out there about how way the public can attend or not attend because what I witnessed was um, where there was a hundred people to me it was perfectly reasonable behaviour and, and, and carried out in a very dignified and, and social distancing way and the risk was relatively low obviously as a result but I think it's just perhaps we need to to push to get that whole thing reviewed in the light of where we are at the moment. It's, it's always going to be a difficult one, Gordon. You have, you know, if you're looking, I suppose, for, and I'm, I'm not a healthcare professional, so I don't know, and I'm not the, the chief scientific officer, so they'll have their own view. Uh, but a group of 150 people not socially distanced at a funeral doesn't have any greater or less health risk than 150 people not socially distanced at a football match. You know, but, but the emotions are completely different between the two and the environments can be different between the two. Police, the policing approach to that understands that, um, but there's no real difference made in, in the regulations currently. Um, again, it's not something we have, I think we've done little or no active enforcement at the time because of the whole dynamic of that, the whole optic of that and the appropriateness of it. Um, which makes it a difficult space for policing, which goes to the conversation that I had with the chair and Linda earlier about progressively the, the healthcare protection regulations will become less of a space for policing over time. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Rachel. Thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, Alan, for attending today. I, I have just a few questions. Um, there has been, I appreciate you sort of outlined the um, change in the emphasis of policing and enforcement. Has there been any updated guidance given to yourselves or, or done by yourselves on the issue of fines? Because I note that they uh, we've reported this morning from 400 down to 30 um, within the month. Um, and have you had any sort of backlash against any enforcement um, given uh, sort of recent reported actions of a certain political advisor in England? Has that affected um, any of your work so far? 
Um, a lot has been made of of the of the changing trend of fines over time, but I gave an explanation of that earlier. I think that's just part of the natural journey. Um, I think they were high in the initial uh, circumstances because at that point the regulations were at their tightest, uh, and the, your ability to breach them or potentially to breach them were at their highest. Uh, and public, having come from a 10-day period of non-enforcement into an enforcement period, you know. It's always, good, it's always good to go back and understand where we were at that point in time. In the mouth of the Easter weekend, there was substantial nervousness across all shades of political opinion and all shades of policing about the infection rate, the ICU bed rate, the good uh, weather forecast for an Easter weekend, and the trend in public behaviour in, in ignoring the regulations up until that point, which required a, an enforcement response to try and rebalance that. Uh, I think the enforcement response was entirely proportionate, entirely professional. Um, the vast majority of people uh, who were in breach of the regulations never got a penalty because they took the advice and returned home. You know, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. And I know much has been made over the time of travel to exercise, but only six tickets out of 400, six fines out of 400 plus were, uh, were for travel for exercise, and they were on the extreme end of what anybody uh, might uh, might uh, anticipate that. And I don't think we should lose sight of that. But over time, as people get used to the regulations, then compliance improves and, then, and the need for fines diminishes. Uh, and then as you then start to relax the restrictions, there's less space for penalty and therefore the fines. So we need to, I think, understand those numbers in that context. Um, and you know, you would expect me as, 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 as the senior commander in charge of that operation to look at that on a daily basis to make sure that we're getting it right. And if I, if I feel that we haven't, if, we, if, if I think we've been too lenient in one place, to look at what we what might need to do about that. And I think if we've been a little bit uh, too firm in others, to put steps in, in, in place to, to, to move that back as well. Uh, and that has been in response to community concern, people's feedback, general conversations in, in places like this. And we, and we do that on an ongoing basis. I think that's good professional placing to do so. Um, so I think that's that's the picture over time, um, in, in terms of, of the penalties issued. Um, but you can see um, from and as, as part of the conversation with um, when you listen to um, my officers, you're quite right. When you listen to my officers and some of the conversations that they've been having in recent weeks, there has been a change in public mindset between being in lockdown and not being in lockdown. So you are getting, uh, you're now getting members of the public even challenging the police's right to ask them the question in the first instance. Um, and that's a space I don't particularly want to put police officers in, particularly around that, you know, we got quite a bit of incoming uh, on social media uh, at the weekend because we were turning traffic away from Port Stewart. And people say, well, what right have the police to do this? Well, Port Stewart was full, mm -hmm. full to the brim. And it was a, we weren't there enforcing COVID regulations. We were there enforcing public safety and traffic management. Well, I, I've seen that myself. <laughs> in the so summer, you had it, to block the town off because people have just came up on. But the in the current circumstance. environment, chair, it's entirely indicative of a changing public mindset yeah. about people saying we were happy to play with the rules now, and now we're not. And as you, as the police, have you know, and actually getting actually some people have been quite belligerent with officers at the roadside saying you have no right to ask me what I'm doing here. You know, th th these laws are not. And I leave it for others to judge about how other events have played into that space, but I, my officers are certainly getting that experience on the ground. Thank you. Um, I certainly have a, an opinion on why that might be, but uh, we'll leave that there. Um, in terms of the COVID hotline that was set up, um, would you have any indication on how many people have used that? Any statistics and follow-ups from that, if there has been any? I, I don't have the current number. It was heavily used in the first instance. Uh, that use has, to, has decreased over time. Uh, and I think that again reflects to people being, uh, you know, we reported thousands of, of uses in the first couple of weeks. Interestingly for us, a lot of that reporting didn't turn out to be breach of the COVID restrictions. It turned out to be breach of the COVID guidelines and they weren't exactly the same thing. And actually a lot of them turned out to be breach of COVID guidelines applicable in England and not applicable here. So, you know, uh, I've seen my neighbour go out for the second time today for exercise, you know, uh, which was actually quite a common one. Um, mm or I've seen my neighbour doing this. That may have been outside guidance. That guidance may not have even been in Northern Ireland, but people's perception was that was against the law and they reported it to the police. We obviously had a triage around that. Um, so as, as people have got used to what the law says and what the guidance is and the difference between the two, that reporting has de decreased over time. Of course, as, as the restrictions have been relaxed, 
then people have also stopped reporting some of that over time. So um, that you can see the trend in reporting. It's still there, it's still in use, and it's still available. We anticipate that that will continue to be the case because it's a good way of managing that demand. Um, but uh, it's certainly declined over time. I don't have the specific numbers today, but I can follow that up for you. Great, thank you. Um, on the executive um, briefing on COVID a couple of days ago, I believe it was Tuesday, Minister Swan had said that we're very likely to enter a second wave of the virus. It's expected in the months ahead. I take the PSNI um, prepared for that, to, you know, with the kind of reorientating of the staff back to a kind of normal policing situation. And would you have adequate levels of PPE if that did happen? Yeah, so, so it's a really good question um, uh, because, uh, and this is this is the tension for somebody in my role and for the chief constable. Um, we're, we're very keen. Uh, chief constable is very keen. I very keen support his desire to put as many and all neighbourhood officers back on the neighbour duties. Uh, in terms of the, the answer given, I gave previously to to, to Ms. Dillon. Um, but we have one eye down the road to what might need to be done, and I'm keen not to put officers on a chain shift to change them back again. Uh, so we're just trying we're just trying to look that we don't do anything that we couldn't undo quickly, or couldn't make other provisions for. Uh, that doesn't mean that I have an immediate plan to put neighbourhood officers back on neighbourhood duties and then withdraw them back from that. I think we can probably do that a different way. But it's certainly something that's in our mind. So uh, the planning uh, will allow for that. Uh, uh, I'm in discussions with staff associations and my planners today and again on Monday about the shift arrangements for our local policing teams. And this co that question plays into that conversation about those plans. It also plays into the plans for the wider organisation um, and all our logistics and our requirement, uh, acquiring of equipment. And as I said earlier, the need to keep the strategic coordination function running on COVID uh, um, filtering of calls, the need to... Um, keep COVID crews, need to keep COVID custody. We're not dismantling any of that in anticipation that we're going to need it for the medium term. Okay, thank you. And finally, Chair, just um, there's been reports and, and photographs sort of circulating of um, a number of nitrogen dioxide canisters around certain communities, particularly in North Down, being found. I'm just wondering, out of interest, is there any measures to deal with this in the current situation by the police? And if you could, because I, I, I don't know, what class of drug are they counted at? Or are they illegal? Do you know? Oh, um the truth is, I don't know the answer to the question in terms of its classification, um, but I will look into it and come back to it. And it's, a, it's, it's classed as a noxious substance, and therefore you're not, you're not allowed to possess it. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's quantified under the Misuse of Drugs Act as a drug, but it is considered to be a noxious substance, and there are controls that go around it. Uh, but that's an, in, in terms of hand this committee, uh, that's a, an, an uninformed view at this time, and, I, and I'll seek to inform my view and come back to you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, Paul Frey. Yes, Chair, thank you very much. And all. Thanks very much for your time here and your, your answers today. Uh, it's very informative, as always. Um, can I ask, what, what presence does the police have at the very heart of decision-making and strategic thought on this? So if there is such a thing as a mini-cobra that the executive has, how, how much of, a, uh, of an imprint has the PSNI on the thinking with regards to that? Why, why I ask that question is, I, I believe that this draconian legislation, whilst it has saved lives, I don't know if we can put a quantity on how many lives it's saved, saved compared to normal, everyday human being, common sense practices. Um, and what I do know is it's certainly we're not designed. We're not designed as a people, people or a nation, to have draconian legislation like this. And, and it has been an experiment, and I think it has proven a lot. Uh, not even for the police to try and enforce something, uh, and you know, the the dangers that that poses for confidence, public confidence in the police and society and, and government as a whole, and and the fact that. This legislation is designed to, to legislate for every twist and turn of a human being's life. It just does not work. So if, if there are discussions going around about lifting restrictions or, or even imposing them again, what, what, what presence does the police have in that consideration? Um, the formal structures that exist at the moment um are the Civil Contingents Group for Northern Ireland, which is a cross-departmental group chaired by the head of the Civil Service. Um, that 
up until recently had been a daily meeting and, and obviously been revised given the changing circumstances. Uh, and I'm a regular attendee, uh, albeit by, by telephone conference in the, in the days that they are, as is the Chief yeah. Constable. Uh, and that gives the Chief Constable and myself a direct line uh, into the thinking and decision making uh, at departmental level across the executive. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, our host department, uh, Department of Justice, uh, consult with myself as the as the police lead uh, and, and other senior police officers uh, across policy development issues across government as and when they feel that there's a relevance for police. And then there, are, I suppose, uh, Mr. Frew, there are other ad hoc common sense arrangements. So. Um, I have a regular uh, phone conversation with the chief medical officer and his staff. Um, because I, I guess one of the, the new things that come out of these regulations is that I'm, I'm sure that the health department don't normally see policing as one of their control measures in delivering health care for the population. But on this case, clearly, um, the, the, the we are. And therefore, discussions around infection rates and what may or may not work and what may or may not be required in terms of relaxation or restriction. Uh, is, a, is a consideration uh, for, for those people, uh, and uh, I'm indebted to the Chief Medical Officer and his staff for the opportunity to feed the police feedback uh, and, and observations in, into that uh, informal decision making process as well. So, there's a lot of there's a formal structures around CCGNI, formal structures around DOJ and consultation on policy, uh, informal pieces between myself uh, and, and other senior leaders across government, and then that's sort of wrapped around. The overall umbrella of the National Police Chiefs Council, based in London, which represents UK policing, uh, and they have a direct input into into Cobra in London. So that's by and large the landscape in which policing, uh, not really, I don't think policing seeks to influence the outcomes, but we certainly feed in what we think are the implications of various proposals for public policy. And, and I, I get that you're as much as uh, that all of us are servants of the law, and you can really only enforce. You should only really enforce what's in statute. Everything else out of that is without the law and, and, and out of the out away from the law. Uh, is is there a time throughout those meetings? I'm not, and again, they might be sensitive and they might be uh, private. But but has there been times when there have been decisions made that would be contrary to the, police, the thinking of the policing uh, that maybe is putting you in a bad position, bad situation, or you just don't think necessary. Has there been any times where that may have there may have been friction like that? Uh, I don't believe so that, that I have been party to. Um, I think we take a view, and I think there are other areas of legislation that uh, that are analogous to this in terms of the policing approach. Um, for policing to work best, our relationship with with lawmakers is to say that legislation is a matter for legislators. Um, Senior police officers like myself are probably best positioned if we say to people, well, if, if you decide that in terms of law, the policing implications of this are, um, or that would need to be policed in this way, which may have impacts on the community in this way or impact on the service in this way. And therefore, we talk to people about the implications and impacts of their decision making rather than seek to, I think it's an unhealthy place for, uh, for police to be seen to be trying to influence the law itself, but merely to advise on the implications of the laws or, or policy as is under, under consideration. Yes. I was interested in your answer, I think it was Rachel, with regards to the number of uh, penalties released on the exercise part. Uh, is, is there a breakdown there of actually, and again, you know, if, if people are being disrespectful or belligerent to a police officer who is basically trying to coax them round to, to head in a different direction home, uh, yeah, that's a different story altogether. But is is there is there a, an itemised breakdown of, of of each ticket and why it was why it was uh, issued? There, I don't have with me today, Mr. Further. There is a categorisation uh, broadly under which regulation was issued. So, um, you know, three, four, five, and six are the are the principal regulations for enforcement. Three and four lies largely with local councils now they've been designated. Um, been a limited space for placing, so we can give you a, a, a breakdown of both the notices and the community restorative notices that were issued under Regulation 5 and under Regulation 6. Okay, thank you. That would be very helpful. Uh, for, for again, I don't think we ever want to be in a position where we're, we're doing this ever again, and, and hopefully that will be the case. But uh, the final point then, Chair, or question is there, there's, going to, there's going to have to be a massive reconfiguration of budgetary requirements and essentials and everything else. Uh, 
where, where does the police? Maybe this isn't your pigeon. I don't get that. But but where where is the where is the police at the minute with regards to the budget requirements and the needs and demands that you guys have? Are you below budget, above budget? Is are you needing more money, or or dare I say, will, will you be in a position to to give money back, considering crime rates are down? Um, what's what's the dynamics being in play at the minute on that? Um, currently, um, COVID, uh, the COVID crisis has added significant cost over and above our normal demand. Um, because of the structure of an organisation, like, like any public service, a big part of our spend uh, is in the salaries. So even though demand may go down uh, in terms of traditional crime demand, the, that doesn't impact on the overall uh, salary uh, costs of the organisation. Um, when you get a COVID crisis like this, uh, there's been a, a significant increase in some of our contracted uh, services. For example, you'd expect cleaning services have been running way, way and above what they would normally have been for reasons that won't require any explanation to this committee. Um, vehicle cleaning, buildings cleaning, um, new protective measures across the police estate, specific custody facilities, large amounts of public uh, of personal protection equipment. Um, you know, put, put it, putting police under 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 shift arrangements. Um, uh, and making sure you have significant numbers to deliver, not only against the, the, the normal policing demands, but the COVID demands on top of that. All of those are resource intensive, uh, and all of those have required additional funding. Uh, the police service has, has received some additional COVID-specific funding, uh, and I understand that there may be uh, some more to add to that. So at, at the moment, there are obviously some areas of our business uh, that are, are seeing um, some reductions in spend, but at the moment, the, the broad sense is that the, the COVID crisis has added expense over and above our budget baseline. Okay, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Is there any other members? Yes, Paul, can I come in, please? Yes, of course. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, Alan, I'm just wondering, in relation, I've had a couple of concerns in my own constituency, but have you had an increase in reports of um, antisocial behaviour or violent crimes, and how have the how has the police service managed these? Um, I think that's Gemma from picking up the voice. It right. is Gemma, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, antisocial behaviour hasn't seen uh, the the number spikes that we have seen, um, but it has maybe changed somewhat in its nature. Um, because the reporting around other social behaviours has at times had a COVID linkage to it as well. So the, the nature rather than the numbers has changed, uh, to, uh, to be truthful. I, I know there are um, reported areas where there have been particular problems with groups of young people. Um, I think that probably gets more focus in a COVID environment. It's not that it's particularly new or they're opposed to resolving it's particularly new, but it probably has a focus and, and a newsworthiness. Uh, that, that gives it that, that prominence in the current environment, uh, rather than by the virtue that it's, it's over and above what we would normally be dealing with. So, no significant concerns on the, on the level of ASB. Uh, violent crime numbers uh, are down uh, in line with the numbers that I talked about earlier. Um, uh, that probably shouldn't surprise us, particularly around um, you know, town centres and centres of population haven't had the same density of people in them. Uh, the uh, pubs, clubs, and restaurants, and the even economy isn't operating, which would, would which would have a contribution towards the violent crime recording. So, cri violent crime against a person is down significantly over the period. Although, again, as I said earlier, that gap is beginning to narrow. That's great. Thank you. Okay, Gemma. She needed. Yes, of course. And um, Paul. I think your phone's putting a bit of disruption through, just if you can... Thank you. Sinead, if you can go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Just two points. Um, I was just curious to know, and apologies if this has been touched on, because the sound quality is not great here, but in terms of to understand better, we do understand uh, domestic violence is very much recorded against the types of crime that are ongoing. Um, regardless of that 30-40% reduction, which I understand has narrowed to 20. But I'd like to have an understanding as well of the other crime that still exists and the PSNI have been dealing with throughout this COVID breakdown. Uh, the other point is 
In terms of messaging, I think there's a very confused public out there. And I'm sure the PSNI, like constituency offices and many um, advice centres across the North, are getting a whole plethora of questions specific to perhaps, say, somebody's business. They're unclear whether they're in the stage where they could consider opening or not. And their measure of this is if I open up or do something, the first point where I know I may have breached a regulation would be when the PSNI present themselves. So therefore, in their logic, a natural first approach would be to contact the PSNI to almost seek approval before they go into something that they that they could potentially then be reprimanded for or their business get a bad uh, reputation for. So people are very, very cautious with good reason. And I just want to know, um, do the PSNI feel as we move through to the next stages, hopefully sooner rather than later, that they have a role to play in communicating clear messaging, timely messaging, and acting as a conduit between the executive and the public because they're very confused. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So um, I think the initial question was on um, what sort of crimes are we currently dealing with? Um, well, the, the truth is everything we normally deal with, just a little bit less of it. Um, and there are variations, as I, as I talked about earlier. So you get really big reductions around shoplifting. But it's still there, so it might be down 70% in some places at, at certain times, but there's still some shoplifting. Um, violent crime is down, but there's still violent crime. Um, burglary is down, but there's still burglary. Theft and robbery are down quite a bit, but it still occurs. Uh, and that's because there are still people out in the streets, still people out in the street, and all the social problems and all the dynamics that sit behind crime still exist in a COVID environment, uh, notwithstanding the restrictions. Um, so this, this, the, no crime type has disappeared, and other than the COVID restrictions itself, there's no new, n not really any new crime type has has emerged. Uh, although cyber attempts and, and cyber security and cyber theft, as I've spoken to you before, is, is, a, con is a continuing concern, um, probably being exploited by the current uh, the current environment. Um, so I think that would be my answer to your to your first question. In answer to your second question. Um, at the, at the risk of saying the answer is no, I don't. I believe the answer is no. Um, I, I've, I've studiously tried to evolve uh, to to uh, avoid, sorry, uh, PSNI becoming the guidance body for for the healthcare regulations. Um, we are one of the designated bodies for enforcement of the regulations, and, and most of that designation uh, involves our work previously around Regulation Five and Six and now largely around Regulation 6. Um, the conduct of business and whether businesses should be open, closed, or trading or not trading uh, falls under Regulation 3 and 4. Um, that is a, uh, a designated space in which local councils have a role. We have a role in supporting them in relation to that. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not personally in favour of the PSNI or indeed local councils acting unilaterally to issue guidance because that would just, I think, see, uh, only open the opportunity to confuse messaging further. I think the regulations come from the executive, uh, and therefore the guidance as to how they're interpreted and what is and isn't possible uh, should be considered through the guidance from a, from a single point of that guidance, which is joined up uh, across the de departments within the executive. Uh, and I think individual bodies, be they councils, PSNI, or anybody else stepping into that space to fill that void, I think creates more problems than it solves in terms of public confusion. Okay, Sinead. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Chair, I would also add that there's a difficulty in, in the police providing guidance to somebody when we're an enforcement body because people then will misquote or misunderstand the advice they were given as a defence to something they may have breached the restrictions on. So I think for those two reasons, I think it's, it's we'll always try to be helpful with it. But, uh, you know, a large number of MLAs will have written to me on a, on a whole range of things asking for guidance, and I've had to politely say that back to them, I can't help you with this one, it's just not appropriate. Well, I know it, it takes me into my kind of final point, because I've, I've heard not just MLAs, but executive ministers, when asked, well, what's the advice in this scenario? Well, ask the police. So it isn't just restricted. You know, it's one of those questions whenever I've been asked by businesses, 
can I do this, can I do that? Then I'm trying to go to the relevant authority, which may be the DERA, for example, was one around fishing. That was one where, yes. uh, or the recycling of waste. I had trying to get my council to reopen the facility and they had said, well, I'm, I'm seeking advice from the police. I said, well, why? Because it's DERA's the department who will issue your advice. Why are you trying to... So it, it does create that issue as to who is the... the Authority, and we raised that with the Attorney General, for example, who is the authority in, in providing this advice. So, if, if if there are ministers who aren't able to give that advice, and then can often I've heard say that's a matter for the police. Well, that then ultimately puts the police in the frame to give an answer. And if you're not able to give that answer, we kind of go around this circle, and then I can understand why the the, the wider public get confused. And and for for what it's worth. I totally sympathise with your position. In fact, I agree with it. I don't think it's fair to be saying that'll be a subjective decision that the police need to take. The regulation's the regulation. That's the law. And therefore, beyond your discretion, you have to enforce the law. Yes. And, and and I think you've outlined why it's not for the police to make the law, but to advise on consequences. So getting the advice going forward, I think, is going to be important. And it takes me to the question that I have around the, the comments that have been made so far on Regulation 6, restrictions on movement. In effect, that's not being enforced, is what, is what I'm hearing. That when it, when it comes to Restriction 6, you, you've indicated that there's that many exceptions now to it. It's putting the police into an almost impossible position to have an offence created under Regulation 5, and therefore, your your sorry, it's re regulation five restrictions on movement, and your real policing space is now in respect of regulation six restrictions related to gatherings. So, if, if regulation five is in effect defunct, should it be repealed as opposed to added to further, because it's no longer really an efficient piece of legislation, which puts the police, I think, in a difficult position because people complain somebody's moving and you're having to investigate that and police it if it's no longer really an effective piece of legislation. What's been your advice to that civil contingency group around restriction of movement, given what you've said around the policing of it? Um, so, uh, with, without being overly politic, Chair, um, the health protection measures are there at the, at the behest of the Department of Health for a range of, of outcomes. Um, so the judgment as to whether Regulation 5 is required now or may be required going forward um, is, a, is a judgment for the wider executive. Um, and that's just in line with the position policing has taken on this. Um, but I won't duck your question in terms of re Regulation 5. Um, it's not defunct. Uh, it, ha it, it may have a serviceability, and there may be still occasions on the police where we seek to enforce it, but I think that will be an extremist, and I think it will be for blatant disregard rather than something that brings a wider um, number of, of our communities in, into play. Um, because as you articulated, there are now a range of defined reasonable excuses, um, and uh, most of the, you know, the, the newer ones around travelling for, uh, to, to, you know, you can meet other people, uh, and you can do an outdoor activity. There's no restriction attached to those by way of even by way of reasonable all the circumstances by way of travel. Um, so uh, it's very it's the the exceptions are wider than the restriction, uh, and therefore is only likely to be used by police in, in blatant disregard or extreme or, or more extreme circumstances. Um, the serviceability of that uh, and and the desirability of that as an outcome is for the people who own the health protection regulations. Um, and this is exactly the, the sort of conversation that was had at CCGNI, where I said the regulations have been open to this. The policing consequences and impact will be this conversation that I've just had. Uh, and that was understood by all those present. And I think the way it's understood in this committee, it was a, it was a natural progression from the relaxation of the restrictions. Okay, no, that, that, that's helpful, because I know some scenarios and sometimes it's useful just to give an example. Your best friend lives in Newcastle and then they're up in the northwest in Straban, for example. They're allowed to meet in terms of the gathering of six. So therefore there's no restriction that actually sorry, that has to be within five miles, ten miles, fifty miles. And therefore you can't 
you know, that, that's where you, you turn to the public to exercise common sense judgment and is that really appropriate given the risks. But from a purely legal policing point of view, there's nothing stopping someone from Newcastle travelling to Straban to meet in a socially distanced way outdoors, so long as it falls within regulation six of the gathering of up to six people. Yeah. Okay, no, that, that, that's been very helpful. Um, on on the, the figure of six, that again can present a challenge. Um, I know some examples where people have met now in a park and it so happened that another family that they knew were there as well and all of a sudden six turned to 12. It wasn't planned, but you live in a locality and those, yeah, how, how do you then police that type of scenario where you could have people standing around and rather than, rather than half a dozen, it's a dozen people? No, for sure. Um, but I think this is where we fall into the four E's approach, which has been a proportionate response by policing to all these matters, Chair, uh, irrespective of which regulation. You know, we have had police officers in patrol in Ormo Park in Belfast, for instance, where there were clearly um, people who might have been seven or eight people socially distanced, being responsible, who met each other, come together for a short period of time and moved on. And, and frankly, from our perspective, you know, that may have been a conversation about folks, if you move on in due course, that'd be great. Um, but you may also had four or five people n not reaching the, uh, the piece of six down at the multi-surface uh, football park, playing five aside, not socially distanced, which would require a different policing response. Uh, so uh, I think the, the, the legislation is always is there for a framework. By the nature of the law, it will always have numbers, uh, but we apply the proportionality, the four E's approach to that, in terms of to what degree that then becomes an engagement, explanation, encouragement, and enforcement space as a matter for professional judgment, as it is in so many parts of the law uh, in terms of proportionate responsible policing going forward. Okay, well, can I thank you, Alan, for your time? I know we, we went beyond what we had indicated, but I have a feeling your session will be the most lengthy um, and, and for obvious reasons. So um, I do appreciate you making yourself available, as you have done at every uh, request of the committee. Uh, and again, thank you for the work that you're doing. Okay, it's, you. it's I don't envy the job. It's a difficult line that you're having to walk. And, um, you know, but um, we do appreciate you being transparent with the committee and giving us honest answers as always. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, folks. Well. Thank you. Thank you all the best. <clears throat>
883 of whom are sentenced, 523 are on remand, 56 are female, 64 are young men at Hydebank, and 83 are over 60 years of age. Between the 1st of May and the 27th of May, we received 232 new committals from the courts, and we have released, as part of the Minister's temporary early release scheme, 143 prisoners who were in the last three months of their sentence. Of the 143, 90 have either been released as time served or are now serving the community licence element of their sentence. 47 remain on temporary release. A further five are currently in custody on matters uh, that are awaiting the courts, uh, and sadly one individual passed away. We have no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our prisons. We had one young man remanded to us who tested positive in the community. However, following a period in our isolation unit, he subsequently tested negative and was admitted to the general population. The risk of an outbreak in the prison environment remains extremely high, and that's why we have a range of measures in place to mitigate the risk, and that's why those measures must remain in place, although we are keeping them under regular review. So what's life like in our prisons at this time? Uh, with the exception of those in our isolation units, all prisoners are unlocked uh, as normal during the day and for evening association, and we're operating a landing-based regime. Learning and Skills College have provided learning packs in each prison, and we're piloting virtual learning between students and teachers at Hyde Bank Wood. Our aim is to roll out virtual learning across all three prisons over the coming weeks. Virtual visits have been extremely uh, successful, and in the past week we've delivered over 631 virtual visits plus 167 virtual legal visits. We've been working hard with the voluntary and community sectors to support families, and the committee will have seen the information booklet we prepared and distributed with the support of NACRO. Since I last attended the committee, staff testing has been facilitated by the Department of Health, and to date 104 members of staff and 33 family members have been referred for testing. So far, six members of staff have tested positive, with the last member of staff testing positive on the 9th of May. We were the first service in the UK to implement a track and trace procedure for staff and prisoners who, tested, who test positive. The procedure was successfully activated when the staff member tested positive earlier this month. In terms of our staffing levels, today 72 officers are absent due to illness. That's what you might describe as our normal sick, and 115 are absent because of COVID-19. That means almost 15% of our staff are currently absent from work. I'm indebted to the, my colleagues in the Prison Service College uh, and NICSHR for keeping the Prison Service recruitment uh, and recruit training ongoing. We have 45 recruits currently in training, with a further six intakes planned between June and December of this year. We will shortly be recommencing our recruitment process using virtual interviews. We continue to work closely with uh, prison uh, and health colleagues in the Five Nations structure that we're part of. We're also linked into Europris COVID-19 infor information sharing structures, and I have a weekly telephone call with the Director General in the Irish Prison Service, and our management teams will be holding a virtual meeting on the 16th of June. Chairman, although access to the prison estate is restricted to essential personnel, I was pleased to facilitate visits, by each, uh, visits to each of our prisons by the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice and the Prisoner Ombudsman. Both reported very favourably, and in doing so commented on the real sense of calm and commitment to keep things as normal as possible. They also noted that our staff are doing the best for the people in our care, before commenting that we have every reason to be proud of them. Right, thank you, and it, it really is a credit to the organisation that you've had no confirmed cases throughout this um, pandemic. Um, uh, that, that is something that I don't think uh, most people would have anticipated whenever this first started, um, and the precautions that obviously that have been taken and the, the preparedness for it 
I think is um, a testament to, to the good work of not just yourself but your colleagues and then the, the individuals, the staff on the front line and, and they've had to manage all of that as well. So uh, a really well done for me in, in terms of how you've been able to achieve that. Um, just a couple of questions because you've, you've covered most of the ones that I wanted to ask in, in your opening remarks so I don't, don't want to uh, prolong proceedings unnecessarily. What, what's the planning um, going forward by way of trying to get the normal regime back in terms of facilitating visits beyond the virtual um, and trying to bring in those outside organisations that would have been coming in before um, in terms of education and, and so on. Uh, is there a plan being prepared and, and, and what's the kind of time frame for implementing that? There are a range of plans uh, that we're working on at the moment. Um, I mean, we're looking at visits, we're looking at learning and skills, we're looking at those external schemes uh, that we operate. So the way it's working for us, uh, every three weeks the senior team and I review the measures we have in place and take a decision as to whether or not we feel the time is right to, uh, to, to make any change to that. We haven't made any change so far. Um, we'll be reviewing our measures again in a fortnight's time. I would doubt that we'll be making significant uh, changes at that stage. We haven't put a time frame, uh, we specifically haven't put a time frame on uh, when change might uh, might take place, but we are working on a number of scenarios, for example, around visits as to how visits might look in the brave new world. But for the moment, um, our priority is to try and keep infection out of the prison, um, and we're very committed at this point in time to essential people only coming in to help us to do that and I think we would want to look very carefully at what happens in, in the wider community uh, as restrictions are eased before we take, uh, before we take decisions um, to, to, to do likewise. Um, in terms of the, the prisoner release scheme, 143 and, and you've given the broke down as to, to the detail on that, is it planned that that release scheme no longer needs to be implemented, that the capacity exists to, to manage those that are in and, and won't need to be released? Um, well, the Minister hasn't yet taken a decision on that, um, but I will be communicating with her very shortly. Um, my view is that we should keep that scheme in place. Uh, I mean, we're sitting today with 1,406 people um, in, in custody. Uh, if you looked at that figure, um, you know, four weeks ago, it would have been probably around 1,370. So you can see the prison population is starting to uh, to creep up again. So, um, whilst the minister hasn't made a decision yet, uh, my preference and recommendation would be that we we do continue the scheme. So, what's I would just like to tease that out, obviously, with you because the justification for it was COVID-19 related. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is that still the the rationale behind having the scheme in place? Because there, there could be a concern that you know this temporary release scheme becomes a permanent scheme just to manage prison population. I, I think there, there's no question of that being the case. I mean, I think we have been very clear uh, that the temporary release scheme is one of a range of measures we have in place to help the prison service manage the challenges that it's facing around COVID-19. Uh, COVID um, so whilst I would like it to stay in place uh, for a period longer, there's no question of that being a permanent arrangement. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Linda? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ronnie, for your brief action. It gave us quite a bit of detail and, and has answered a number of my questions as well, so I appreciate that. Just a, a couple of things. I mean, I think are to be commended that the that both CGA and the Ombudsman have, have been so complimentary, I think has um does reflect that y you have done a really good job and particularly in obviously in keeping COVID out of the, the prison population and therefore protecting those prisoners and, and staff. Can I just ask um and I know we had talked about this a wee bit before so just it's it's a further question to what we had talked about, Ronnie. In the separated prisoners' houses um, there isn't infrastructure, as you had outlined, for the virtual visitation, and therefore they have to go through the hospital to to 
to go to where they need to go in order to do the virtual vis- visitation. Is that being looked at? Is there a way around that? And I know the infrastructure is not in place. And obviously bringing contractors in at this time, which I, I totally accept, would be nonsensical to bring contractors in when you're not bringing people's families in. So, but is there a way of doing it even in terms of um, laptops with Wi-Fi or things like that, just in the interim? And then going forward, you've talked about the success of the virtual visits. And again, we had talked about this previously and, and you had said, particularly for those prisoners who hadn't maybe seen their families in a number of years. And it was the first face-to-face visits it had. So I think that obviously that has been something that has been helpful to the, to those individuals and to their families who have done nothing wrong at the end of the day. Their families have suffered due to that and they, they aren't the, the person who has committed any criminal offence. So going forward, is is it your intention to, to keep, to retain what has been learned out of this that actually is good practice and works for you? And then just finally, have you any assessment of... Um, I suppose why things have worked so well and prisoners have cooperated so well. So in terms of the what measures have been put in place, are some of those maybe things that will be worth keeping because it actually makes life better for prisoners and staff. So I'm not talking about making prison a holiday camp for people, but if it's actually making life better for people and, and then potentially better outcomes for those people at the other end of this because we've had this conversation as well in this committee that, that your role is actually to try to help people when, that whenever they come out of prison that they are reformed, that they do have a better prospect of having a, a better life whenever they get out and not ending up back in prison. So I'm, I'm just wondering, have you a wee assessment and my last question, probably ties in a wee bit um, what is your assessment around prisoners who I suppose have had mental health issues or have had to be under um, 24 hour watch in this period has that went up, has it went down has it stayed static um, so I'm looking to know has this been a greater challenge, challenge for those with mental health issues, has it maybe helped them in some way because they have those additional um, things in place or has it just remained pretty much the same um, I would take your last question first, because um, I think that it's a really interesting question in terms of uh, safety within prisons. Um, I suppose one of the one of the, the the benchmarks that I have is that I get on a daily basis statistics around the number of prisoners who are on the supporting prisoners at risk program, um, and and you'll find this I think really interesting because over the past number of months. During the lockdown period, we have seen a decline in the number of, of um, prisoners on that particular scheme. I mean, if I look at the past 24 hours, for example, um, we had a total of 13 prisoners on the SPAR program. Now, if you looked at that figure a year ago, a year and a half ago, that figure would have been in the 30s and the 40s. Um, so there's something really interesting happening happening there, and I think that's uh, that's really positive. I mean, we are working and staff are working extremely hard at the moment. Um, all prisoners are, are engaged on a, on a landing-based regime. So that means they're not leaving their landing, they're not leaving the, their, their house block so that we can, we can keep different landings separated. Um, and we're obviously letting people exercise and so forth. But you know, when I was in McGavery yesterday, for example, in, in Davis House, which is our new building, um, you know, I witnessed there a rowing competition where we brought in rowing machines, um, you know, and prisoners from each leg of the house were out competing against each other. And I, you know, totally so- socially distancing, uh, but you know, that's one example of what staff are doing. They're running competitions. They're doing various things to keep people uh, occupied and, I suppose, entertained to an extent. Um, so, I think that has helped. Um, obviously, uh, we don't have. Uh, visits at the moment and, and we know that, that visits and the external schemes we operate uh, can be supply routes for drugs to get into prison um, so it's been uh, much easier to, to manage to manage that and I think that has contributed uh, so there are a range of things I think that are contributing to the safety of prisoners and are, are keeping the population um, I think as calm and stable as, as we can 
Um, I think in fairness to the people in our care as well, you know, they're they're watching their TVs, they're they're seeing the news, they know what's happening on the outside. Um, there's lots of families, I think, you know, who are very happy with the virtual visits and not having to come to the prison with the risks that that would involve for the family and indeed for the individuals. Um, and, and I found it strange really when we were uh, suspending visits back on the 23rd of March, you know, I, I had a number of prisoners said to me when I visited the prisons on St. Patrick's Day, when are you closing? When are you stopping visits? Because people actually, I think, recognised and realised the risk, not just for them, but for their families. So I think all of those factors have, have helped to maintain, uh, maintain the situation. On, on your second question around virtual visits, um, I would absolutely want that to be a permanent feature um, in, in, in the new world after COVID-19. I think it's been a tremendous success for us, uh, not just, for example, with foreign national prisoners who haven't seen families or, or haven't had visits from family members maybe in years, uh, but also, uh, you know, the men and the women can, can see their families in their home environment um, you know, can see their pets, can see all of those things, and that that's had a tremendous effect um, on people. And sometimes we take those things for granted without realising the impact. So we would want to keep virtual visits. Um, I think, you know, it it will also, uh, you know, cut down on travelling for you know maybe young mothers who are going to McGilligan from Belfast or from elsewhere. You know, it will help in all of that. So that would stay. In terms of of your first question around separation. Um, I mean, all prisoners have access to virtual visits, um, and the overwhelming majority are, are accepting that. Uh, separated, distant Republican prisoners are not accepting virtual visits um, at the moment. Uh, you're right in saying it wouldn't be appropriate to bring contractors on site. Um, and I would also say that there are ongoing sort of legal communications around this issue at the minute, so I want to be very careful what I what I say that I don't um, I don't cut across things that are happening elsewhere, but but certainly um, I mean I would be very confident that we could afford the same degree of safety to all prisoners who wish to avail of virtual visits um, at this time, um, and would obviously encourage all prisoners to do that. But I understand uh, that that's not the position we're in, but we will keep it under review. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Ronnie, for your update, and well done in managing the prisons during the, these most difficult times. I suppose the restriction and movement of persons in and out of the prison was a big factor in, in controlling that. Absolutely. And um, you've already mentioned it. I understand you have 115 staff off due to COVID-19, um, and testing is available for the staff. Mm -hmm. Is that on, on a voluntary basis? Or? It, it is on a voluntary basis, yes. Um, now, testing is available if you're, if you're symptomatic. Um, of that 115, probably around 90 of those people uh, are, have shielding letters or shielding requirements. So, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to be coming back, I suspect, uh, on, the, on the short term. Um, the remainder are people who... Uh, are off because they they have, you know, they're feeling unwell or they may have symptoms, and it's it's those people we be would be uh, focusing the testing on. For about twenty five of them, would that be roughly? And then, and I mean, the, the the figure changes on a daily basis, but it would be in and around that. Yes. Where do they go for the testing? Or um, they go to one of the testing the testing sites, um, the one at Balmoral, and I think there's one in the northwest. Um, so it, it's just one of the normal uh, Department of Health testing sites. And they're secure from a security point of view? They're they, 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 they are indeed. Um, we're, we're working, uh, staff organise, make arrangements through the prison service for those tests. Uh, they, can, they can go themselves independently, uh, but we encourage them to do it through the service because we can, uh, we can work to ensure their safety and um, a speedy response. Six staff have tested positive, is that right? Yeah, six, six staff have tested positive. Um, five of them tested positive uh, fairly early on in the process. 
Um, and indeed, uh, when I was in um, McGavery yesterday, I met one of the staff who tested positively, positive early on, and is now back in, in, back in work. Um, and one, as I said, tested positive earlier this month. So you're still around six, six off because of... No, no, the, of, of those six, um, a number of those people are back to work again. Right, no, are they? Uh, right. Because they, they tested... Uh, they tested positive. They're not all back, but but a number of them are back. Okay. Uh, I just noticed the the newsletter or the book that was pro produced for families, which yes. is very informative. Um, I understand the prisoners do have bank accounts. Is that right? Uh, we we operate a system. Yes, where where money can be lodged. Um, it used to be visitors would come up and would lodge money would, would hand money over. Now we're doing it through, in effect, a credit card type system so that um, so that there's no cash exchanging hands and it's a better system for us in the current climate. And, uh, it was just as a matter of interest, can they purchase things online? Uh, no, they wouldn't be purchasing things online. Uh, they would purchase things from the, from the tuck shop uh, that we operate. So, you know, there'd be an extensive range that they could they could buy or things could be you know, family members could purchase things online for them and leave them into the prison, but they themselves wouldn't be wouldn't be ordering things online. And that's not available to them. No, no. And the virtual visits you've you've mentioned, which obviously you're keen to retain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, very much so. I uh, understand it's once a week. Is that right? Uh, no, it can be it can be more than that. Um, mm -hmm. It can be uh, up to twice a week. Now we're still rolling this out, um, and as I said earlier, you know we did six hundred and thirty one of them last week. We're we're trying week on week to build that up, but there will have been some uh, that will may have had more than one one visit. It's, it lasts about twenty minutes or thereabouts. And it's in a, in a private room, private environment then. Um, well, it, it it depends. I mean, in McGilligan, um, I mean, I was in. A room on Tuesday where there were three uh, virtual visit stations set up. Um, in McGabry yesterday, you know, I saw in Davis uh, one virtual visit um, machine in a room. Yeah. So there is a degree of privacy, but there's staff supervision as well. Yeah. So it is monitored. Yes, it is. Staff are supervising, uh, are supervising them uh, during the virtual visit. Okay. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Chair. You, Gordon, Rachel. Um, thank you, and thank you, Ronnie, again. Um, certainly just to echo the Chair's statement that having no cases in, within the prison service throughout this is an absolute testament to the work of yourselves and the measures that you've had to put in place, although uh, they're not ideal. Um, I have a, just a couple of questions uh, on this, following on from what Linda had been saying about the mental health um, issue within prisons and with prison officers and prisoners. Um, in terms of the SPAR programme, I said that it was 13 on yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, is that SPAR programme delivered still by the Trust and, um, remotely, or is there people available? Oh, no, no, it's the people. I mean, there, there are prison, obviously prison officers and healthcare staff are on the ground, uh, so it's, it's being delivered um, in each of the establishments. Very brilliant. Um, and then again, just a uh, follow on from your answer to, to Linda about the level of drugs in prisons. Are the levels sort of similar to the same as before, or is there a notable decrease? Um, we don't have visits at the moment, and we don't obviously have the external schemes. And very often, you know, it's the external schemes where people can be pressurised to, to try and bring things back in. So, um, I mean, the level of drugs within prisons has significantly, very significantly reduced as a result of the suspension of those two arrangements. Um, in terms of the level of PPE, have you still enough? And is there any issues there? And if we do have a sort of second wave in a general society, would you have be prepared for that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do want to pay tribute to uh, to, to my staff and in, in, in estates management. I mean, they've worked extremely hard to secure a number of contractors for us and to ensure that throughout this process we have adequate levels of, of PPE. Um, I have a, a morning meeting with all of the governors uh, every morning at nine o'clock, and we review our PPE levels. Um, I mean, we have more than adequate supplies at the moment. Um, and we continue uh, on a rolling basis to have very significant um, orders that are that are pending. So, um, I mean, I'm very comfortable with the levels of PPE we have at the moment, um, and can't foresee an issue at this stage. Now, 
you know, things can change and we have to keep that under review. But, you know, we have very significant quantities uh, in place and on order and we will continue that on a rolling basis. Okay, thank you. And finally, Chair, this is a, not COVID related, but just out of interest, does the prison service have any responsibility over Lorne, Lorne House Holding Centre or is that strictly with the Home Office? No, we, we have no responsibility for Lorne House. Thank you. Thank you. Are you able to quantify the very significant reduction in prevalence of drugs? Is there figures for that? I don't. I don't have figures. Um, we're certainly. We're certainly looking at that. Um, I mean, the number of fines have obviously gone down significantly, uh, but I don't. I don't have specific figures. Um, but certainly, governors would be reporting to me regularly that uh, you know the fact that we don't have the visits and we don't have the external schemes. You know, the you know the the route into a prison for drugs is is now very very limited, um, and I think you know that and speaks for itself in many ways. Uh, now, obviously, the South Eastern Trust are still administering prescription medications um, to to a significant range of prisoners, but if we're talking about illegal uh, substances coming in, that's been greatly reduced. But I, I don't have an exact figure. That 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 would have not gone positive consequences in terms of then the management of prisoners and those that need to be on prescription medication rather than illicit. Is that is that something that's coming through that, that you know, the management of that, was there an initial, like everything, if there's withdrawal from not getting it, that can create tension. But now that the situation is stabilised, are we seeing positive benefits for prisoners that need to be taken off drugs? I think I think undoubtedly. Um, I mean, the challenge for us will be moving forward when normality begins to return. Um, and you asked me earlier about some of our recovery planning. Obviously, that's a very key area for us um, because you know I I would have concerns that if drugs started to come back into the prison environment, you know the tolerance levels will be will be down, um, and there's a risk there for us as as a service and for the individuals. So you know, there's a range of work going on there to see, you know, how best we can manage that, both in terms of restricting supply, but also in terms of supporting, uh, supporting individuals who are coming into our care with addiction issues, of which there are a very significant number, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that's interesting. And but very curious to see the outworking of of that in terms of the drugs aspect. Um, are there any members on the line that want to, to ask questions? Yes, Chair Sinead yeah. Bradley, if possible. Yes, of course, Sinead, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, just two points. Uh, just to get a, a briefing on prisoners who receive shielding letters, are they mostly um, in the relief scheme or in isolation units? And secondly, just to seek a reassurance that you know, they've done a really good job. I commend everybody in doing such a good job in keeping COVID-19 out of the prisons. Um, in the unfortunate circumstances where uh, it did manage to infiltrate the prison population, is there an emergency contingency plan in place? Um, and is there sufficient space to further isolate uh, prisoners if required? Um, I mean, there, there are a number of things there, if, if I can address. Um, I mean, you, you touched on the shielding issue, first of all, uh, and we, we do have uh, a significant number of prisoners who would be of an age or would have rece or would be suffering underlying medical conditions that we need to uh, take very, very specific action towards in order to maintain their, their safety. We, we don't have them in isolation, but what we do have is we have brigaded them together. Uh, for example, if you go to McGilligan, uh, we would have brigaded many of our older men there together in one or two landings. Um, and we are very strict in terms of who can go on to those landings and, and who cannot go on to those landings. So we're shielding them in that way. Isolation is, is something slightly different. Um, I mean, we have today 117 prisoners um, in our isolation units. Now, we haven't those people there because they have symptoms. We have them there because they're new committals that are coming into the prison system. Uh, and part of our precautionary measures is that everybody who comes into prison now uh, is put into an isolation unit for a period of 14 days before they're released out into the general population. 
uh, because you know we're as I said earlier, you know we've had two hundred and thirty two committals. Um, we we can't take the risk that some of those people uh, are are carriers and that and we don't know about it. So we're putting those individuals into uh, into the isolation units, and then the fourteen days are up there. They're moved out, so they're kept separate from the general uh, the general population. Uh, in terms of your question, if we had a case or an outbreak, uh, which, as I said earlier, is a, still a very strong possibility, uh, we do have plans in place in terms of how uh, of how we would manage that, um, and we can you know we can ramp those plans up uh, as as we need to. But yes, we have arrangements in place to try and ensure that we would stop the spread of the virus if it did get into our prisons. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other member on the line? Yes, Nurse Michaelman. Yes, Gemma. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Ronnie, for that. It's actually really useful. Um, I just have a question. When the Minister was in with us a couple of weeks ago, she mentioned that a number of the prisoners who'd been released on early release scheme um, had to be returned to prison. I'm just wondering, um, what's that number at now? Has it increased or is it the same? Okay, um, 143 prisoners, as I said earlier, released early. Um, yeah. Nine uh, were returned for uh, reoffending. Now, of that nine, four um, have subsequently been released as time served, so they're no longer in the in the prison system. So it gives you an idea of how close to release those people actually were. Um, yeah. And and one is currently uh, out on bail, uh, having been uh, released by the courts. Um, we ourselves have recalled um, four other prisoners for reported breaches um, and two of those individuals have subsequently been released um, as time as time served. So in total we're talking about nine returned uh, for alleged reoffending um, and four retur- recalled for reported breaches. So the figure is broadly the same uh, I think as it was when the minister uh, Brief the committee. There may be a, a difference of one. I just, I'm not entirely sure about that. But, but it, the figures are broadly the same. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's just a difference of one. That's that's fine, Ronnie. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Paul, have you anything? Are you content? No, no. Other, other, other than just to say to Ronnie, uh, well done, and uh, keep up the good work. You know, the figures are very impressive. Uh, under tight, controlled situations, that our prison service have to work under. Um, it's a remarkable achievement, I think, and it has to be noted. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Sarah, could I just make a yes, point? Gordon. Running a chaplains, I understand, are unable to visit. Do the prisoners have access to online church services at the moment? Uh, well, that's not that's not strictly true that the chaplains um, are unable to visit. For example, you know, I know that there are some chaplains who are going in and and visiting, uh, including. Um, in our isolation units, although they're they're donning the PPE equipment uh, to do that. Right. I mean, I, I have to say our chaplains have always done a fantastic job and have continued to do a fantastic job. Um, I mean, for example, at Hyde Bank Wood, uh, I know they're doing a very short service over the tannoy right. system every week. Um, right. So they're yeah. still, I mean, they're still very active. Um, and we have been, I think, very careful to ensure and to encourage uh, that individuals receive the, the spiritual support and guidance that they're they're absolutely under prison rules entitled to have. Could you get access to the online services? Is that uh, no, that wouldn't be. I mean, we we don't prisoners don't have access to the internet in the way that you or I would yeah. have. So they yeah. can't just log in and and um, uh, you know and, and watch something online. I mean, they could listen to something obviously on the radio, yeah. uh, for example. Um, yeah. But not not on not online as such. So there is some limited visits of chaplains at the moment. Chaplains, the chap are the vast majority. Some of our chaplains are older men who are obviously shielding themselves. But um, chaplains are still actively engaged in in all of the prisons, and we would we would encourage that, and we'd want to facilitate that. I would see chaplaincy as an essential as an essential service within a prison. Very good. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Um, Ronnie, can I thank you very much for your ongoing work and taking the time to come to the committee today. As always, it's much appreciated. Look forward to having you when it's not COVID-19 related. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, members, we're catching up on time here, so. Yes. We're gonna have uh, the next items, Peter and Lee. Come in. Page. Uh, I don't think they have a submission, so that's fine. Oh well, I'll do that. Um, Peter, uh, can I welcome you to uh, the committee um, in terms of providing us with an update. Um, it'll be recorded by Hansard and obviously then it'll be published on the committee webpage. So I'm going to let you make some opening remarks and then um, I'll hand over to the teleconference folk first, seeing as I don't want to treat you as second class citizens, <laughs> even though you're dialing in. So I'll, uh, I'll take those members first and then I'll open it up to, the, to those that are in the, the committee room. Peter, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks for your invitation to come today to update the committee on, on our response to the current public health emergency and, and our recovery plans. Uh, the pandemic has necessarily changed how services are provided, including for courts and tribunals. When I was here on the 19th of March, I, I advised that the Lord Chief Justice had issued directions on the handling of court business, which sought to limit the scope of any risks to health while maintaining the administration of justice. At that time, the focus was on the continued delivery of priority proceedings, which typically involve the immediate liberty, health, safety and well-being of individuals. Examples include first remands and bail applications in criminal proceedings, known molestation orders in domestic violence cases and urgent children order applications, such as care orders, emergency protection orders and secure accommodation orders, and in civil proceedings, urgent injunctions and judicial reviews. The following week, we consolidated business into five venues uh, at the Royal Courts of Justice, Laganside, Lisburn, Derry and Dungannon. This allowed us to concentrate our staff uh, and other resources and manage the number of staff who are required to travel to work. Staff worked quickly to introduce new arrangements to avoid the need for parties to attend court, consistent with the, uh, the overarching stay-at-home message. Systems were implemented which allowed legal reps to submit templates for progressing cases which would then be dealt with by uh, the relevant judge administratively or, if necessary, by way of a hearing. Uh, the Courts and Tribunal Service has been making greater use of new video conferencing te technology to facilitate virtual hearings in place of traditional face-to-face -face hearings. Virtual hearings have become standard across all court hubs and are being used in new areas of court business such as first appearance from PSNI custody suites and applications for non-molestation orders. Building on these early foundations, the Lord Chief Justice has held a series of meetings with key stakeholders in relation to criminal, civil and family justice matters. The latest guidance issued on the 12th of May uh, moved, uh, to the position, or moved the position from one of dealing with urgent or agreed matters to more proactive handling by judges uh, with administrative reviews to inform case progression and listing for hearing. The Court of Appeal has completed its initial review and several cases have been listed uh, for a physical hearing planned uh, on the 1st of June. This hearing is being used as a proof of concept for what a socially distanced court will look like, together with a range of supporting procedures and measures to ensure that we provide a safe environment for all court users. Judicially led administrative reviews of all Crown Court business is underway to identify cases that can be effectively progressed through various stages from arraignment to sentence. Adult magistrates and youth courts business uh, is extended to include committal proceedings and sentencing. And the presiding district judge is developing a pilot sentencing court in Belfast, which will test the effectiveness of brigading business by solicitor to increase throughput. Given the particular challenge of managing jurors in the current circumstances, the Lord Chief Justice has asked us to develop arrangements to support the delivery of a physically distanced jury trial. This work en uh, encapsulates not just physical changes uh, required within the courtroom, but scrutiny and re-engineering of the entire process from the point potential jurors are called through to their discharge at the end of the trial. We aim to present proposals to the Lord Chief Justice and other stakeholders in June. In relation to family business, which I know has been raised by a number of members, judicially led reviews are underway uh, in family care centre county court cases, uh, which are listed for week commencing the 8th of June. Part of this process will encourage parties to lodge reports and other documentation electronically, which can then be shared securely and reduce the reliance on hard copy files. In addition, it is intended to pilot family proceedings courts, which is at the magistrate's courts level in Lisburn and Ards. 
This will allow us to test capacity to manage full family court lists through a blend of judicial direction and virtual hearings. Finally, in relation to family business, the presiding county court judge is currently piloting a virtual court to deal with undefended divorces in Belfast, with a view to extending this to all areas from mid-June. There is no doubt that getting back to a new normal for courts and tribunals will be challenging. The traditional model for courts cannot be used under the current circumstances, and until social distancing measures are significantly relaxed, physical attendances should be used where there is no practical alternative. We will continue to grow our virtual court capacity. However, we recognise that virtual technology will have some limitations, which have been highlighted by recent evaluations in England and Wales, including slower throughput, the need for regular breaks, and not being suitable for particular types of of court proceedings. Physical court hearings will always be necessary, and we are working to modify the court estate to accommodate this. Early indications are of a substantially reduced capacity, with some venues potentially being unsuitable. Tribunals are on a largely similar trajectory to the courts. Having initially scaled back to essential business only, they are now working to identify cases which can be delivered remotely through a mixture of video, telephone and paper-based hearings. The Appeals Tribunal, which deals with benefits appeals, issued 2,400 letters to appellants offering remote hearings, and staff are now working with the President to list those cases which can proceed. Finally, at a previous briefing, I advised the Committee that the Courts and Tribunal Service was working to establish the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board. This important new service opened to receive applications on the 31st of March, and notwithstanding the lockdown restrictions, redress board panels have convened virtually to consider and assess completed applications for compensation. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. Um, Paul Frey, you've indicated you have a question. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Yeah, P- Peter, thank you very much for your attendance and your, your statement there. Uh, it's very, very helpful. First question, I suppose, is. What venues do you deem not suitable? Um, I, I don't know that I would say a, a definitive answer in relation to any of them. We, we are uh, we've are arranging for all venues to be surveyed. Um, but while there is a requirement for social distancing to be in place, it is conceivable that, that some of those smaller venues, which maybe only have one courtroom uh, and maybe have very narrow waiting facilities, um, may not be particularly suitable for uh, the likes of, of family business or, or other closed courts where everybody other than the proceed- other than the parties in the, the case being heard need to wait outside. Um, I, I think um, some of the some of the waiting areas at, at our smaller courts are, are, are so small that, that they genuinely wouldn't be able to accommodate uh, a socially distanced uh, audience. Well, well, social distancing guidelines are two metres, and, and yet, and, and I guess I, I know for having been in a number of our courtrooms that they can be pokey and they can be inadequate for waiting and for the likes of family business. Um, but surely, is that not the procedures that you're actually looking to monitor and uh, adapt so that? You could do away with those some antiquated practices that, let's face it, were in place before this. Yeah, I, I, I think, Paul, the, the, the future delivery model will undoubtedly have to be a blend of, of um, virtual hearings, physical hearings, and administrative management of cases. Um, but I, I maybe give you a couple of, of practical examples of, of the work that we've been doing around social distancing. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the, we, we have a, a case listed for a physical hearing next week in the, the uh, High Court. Uh, and we're using the Nicey Prius courtroom, which is the, the biggest courtroom uh, in that building. Uh, normally, uh, that, that room would be capable of, of accommodating um, pro- probably around 70 people. Um, to have it socially distanced uh, and compliant with the, 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 the two metre uh, policy, uh, the capacity of that courtroom reduces to, to 17. Um, and, and that that uh, analysis is is replicated whenever we look uh, across the estate. We we've uh, had plans developed for all all the court building, all the courtrooms in lag inside courts, um, and the reduction in capacity there is, is similarly marked. I mean, I I would uh, say that on on average, the capacity of courtrooms uh, would fall to about 30% of of what their normal capacity would be, um, and I think that 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 will. 
that will indicate uh, challenges in trying to, to manage business until social distancing measures are relaxed somewhat. Um, it's also incumbent on us to make sure that we know how to use that capacity to best effect. Um, if, for example, we know that a particular courtroom has a capacity of 20 people, we, we, we need to work with the, the judiciary and, and stakeholders, prosecution, defence, parties, to agree how to use that. Is it 20 people per hour? Is it, is it 20 people per half an hour? How do we brigade and, and structure business so that we have a flow coming through that isn't presenting challenges uh, in the, the ingress and egress of people from the building? Yes, uh, and I suppose that egress and ingress of people, surely... Surely that's more to do with personal, with personal responsibility and probably under the tuition of, of solicitors, barristers and representatives that would be conducting uh, appeals. Yeah. It, it strikes me that really, it strikes me that it's very important that the action of court and the, the law being conducted is, is a, a symbolism as much as practice. The same way as I was dead against the assembly not meeting I'm dead against the courts not meeting for most business. So the more we can get cranked up, the better, including including family courts, because that's something that maybe comes to our constituency offices more than most uh, court business. Uh, and and it, it seems to be the case that in, in small instances, parents and body and, and people have actually used these restrictions as a weapon. And, and, and that's turning law on its head. Um, and, and I think that there needs to be some action taken to instigate family courts. Now, I know that, having spoken to the Attorney General, that cases could still go on and develop if, 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 if suffering could be proven. The, the problem for solicitors there seems to be the case that suffering seems to be a class as abuse abuse only, whereas we, we know that suff children suffering can, can encapsulate a lot more, a broader term than, than, than actually mental or physical abuse or, or physical abuse. So, so to me, there's a massive issue here that's, that's swelling up as an undercurrent in our society that's, that's going to manifest itself pretty soon if we do not get back up, cranked up into action. Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully, Paul, the, 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 the initiatives around the family proceedings courts in, in Ards and Lisburn give you a sense that that, that increase in, in business is, is going to happen. Um, I, I know that the, the Chief Justice and the, 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 the Ministers for Health and Justice have, have issued statements around uh, the challenges of, of contact in, in family cases. Um, and and there, was, there was an emphasis on the parties making arrangements between themselves, recognising what the challenges were of the, the, the coronavirus crisis. Um, stressing the, the importance of, of working together in the best interests of the child, but, but I acknowledge what you've said, that there will be instances where people have used that to, to their, own, um, their, their own ends. Um, the guidance from the Chief Justice did say that um, where, where a case was subsequently listed for hearing, and, and, and urgent cases can already still be listed for hearing, but, but where cases are, are subsequently listed for hearing, and it's demonstrated to the court that, that one of the, the parties have acted in bad faith, uh, that the court will take that into consideration uh, in, in making future decisions. Uh, and, and there was an, a, a, a focus on perhaps lost time with the, the, the parent being made up uh, subsequently. Um, but 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 I, I appreciate that the issue that you raised is 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 a real one for for for, for the, the, the current time. Uh, the, the final point, chair, then is on the issue also then of tribunals for uh, our appeals for uh, PIP and uh, ESA, whereby you're going into a venue, whether it be a boardroom or a, a courtroom. Uh, in Bellamina, for instance, we use courtroom three, which is very adequate for that. I might add, looks more like a classroom, and there's plenty of space within the room. So you're talking about three people on the appeals panel. You're talking about a secretariat there. And you're talking about the principal, the appellant, and, and the representative. Surely there should be social guidance, guidance issued there that will be adequate to continue appeals. Because I think, whilst at the minute there's been a, a raft of paper uh, appeals going in, it was the appeals panels themselves that never, ever liked using 
paper appeals. They always wanted to see the principal appellant. And, and I think people, this, this will hurt people gravely with regards to decisions being delayed and being made wrong. Uh, and I think the sooner we get to, to physical appeals, the better. And, and, and if it is done through Zoom, that's still going to be better than a paper exercise appeal. Uh, because they will still get to see the, the, the appellant, they'll still get to see the whites of their eyes, and they'll still get to see the body language and the answers that they give, uh, which is far more valuable than anything you've ever put down on paper. Uh, and it strikes me that if you can queue up to go into a news agency to buy a chalk pop, really, we should be able to go to an appeal in order to get people benefits that they, they, they really require and need. Uh, I, I agree with, with all of that, um, I, and maybe it would be helpful just to say, uh, I mentioned earlier that the appeal service had written out to uh, just under 2,500 appellants, uh, giving them options for how their cases could be progressed. Um, of those, 61% six, said that they would still prefer a face-to-face -face oral hearing. 25% um, said that they would accept a, a paper hearing. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why that is the case. Because it really is a no win, no uh, it's really a no lose situation. Yeah. Because they're still giving the option to go to a physical hearing if they're not happy with the paper appeal. Yeah. So uh, it was a no brainer. Of course, you were going to send all your constituents and all your appeals towards a paper in the interim period, uh, so that they wouldn't get left behind or so that they wouldn't be wouldn't have a delay. Because the, there's a chance that the paper appeal comes back. Uh, a positive, which means, or, or even if it's stalled or, or they're, they're given an award for an extended period. Um, and, and so it's a no-brainer to, to go down the paper route, but it's, it's surely not a sufficient way to proceed. No, I think the, the, key, the key figure was that only 13% uh, wanted to go down the, the video conferencing route, uh, and that may be indicative of, of a lack of confidence in, in a new technology, and, and we need to be able to demonstrate that, that that is a robust, reliable system, that they're not going to be disadvantaged by using it. Um, so I, th I think there's a piece of work to be done around communicating the, the benefits of that. Um, but, but we... surely, surely in this day and age, when you look at the actions of the Supreme Court of all places... Yep and the innovations that they have used. This is an opportunity for the courts and tribunal service to actually innovate. This is more opportunity probably than hindrance uh, in moving forward with paperless court systems. It absolutely is, and, and, and indeed we, we have done things during this this past nine weeks that, that under normal circumstances would have probably taken a lot longer to achieve, uh, and, and we, we will hope to, to, to build on that and, and mainstream some of the, the uh, innovations that we, we've, we've done. Okay, thank you, Peter. No problem. Okay, thank you. Um, Sinead or Je uh, Gemma, any questions? Yes, thank you, Chair Sinead Bradley here. Uh, thank you, Peter. Peter, two two questions. Um, I'll start off because we're on the topic of the benefit appeals. And I suppose at the outset I declare that I never did find a court building to be a suitable venue for a benefit appeal. I think it's suggestive at the outset that something's amiss, and I think um, the applicant is put on the back foot before the start, and a lot of people won't even up uptake their right to appeal because of the venue and setting. So I do see an opportunity in this. I obviously, like everybody, am eager to see that appeals do happen um, sooner rather than later, so that nobody is disadvantaged in any way in terms of their entitlement. But I do see this as an opportune moment to perhaps look at um, placing that body of work in a more appropriate venue or system of operation, and that may well be um, that it could be through teleconferencing with an advocate alongside. So if that be, for example, the benefit applicant alongside their representative and Citizens Advice Bureau have to be singled out and own advice NI um, for being fabulous at that work and that their resource to perhaps have the applicant with them feeding into live teleconferencing, but I would like to I would like to think that that type of work is being considered at this time, and it takes a lot of the pressures off the physicality of the court room and house um, for other type of work, which in my mind it was originally built and set up for. 
Um, and the second point while I'm on, um, in terms then of the new build and how the courthouses and systems might look, in the event of the case being heard where it was understood to be in the public interest that there would be a public gallery of that case, have, has there been any consideration given to live streaming um, of such a case from a public gallery perspective? Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. Just in, in relation to the the first uh, question, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think I think I have a slightly different view on, on the suitability of the court estate. Um, I, I I'm not sure. I, I understand entirely the, the perception that you, you articulated, um, but I, I kind of look at the court estate as being used for a wide range of business, not not just criminal business, which is what that that perception is predicated around. We we have vulnerable groups. We have. Um, family proceedings, we have civil proceedings, I mean there, there's a wide range of business that's done uh, in court buildings and in fact there's a, a dedicated tribunal hearing centre in, in the, the Royal Courts of Justice. Uh, I, I do think that there is a need to make sure that, that where the court estate is being used for tribunal cases that it is suitable parts of the court estate, that it, it's not austere, it's not formal, um, that, that it, it does lend itself more to that, that informal layout and, and we do have some buildings which are capable of achieving that. Um, but but I think you've raised a, a valid issue. I mean, as, as we move forward, there are going to be greater pressures on how we use the court estate because of the fact that we can't pack as much business in. Um, and it is conceivable that uh, the focus around criminal business, which is the one that probably most needs to be dealt with in, in the, the, the formal court buildings, may begin to displace some of the capacity that we have for tribunals. Um, to that end, uh, we, we are already working with the, the large number of, of current out centres that we use for tribunals to assess how many of those uh, are capable of continuing in a socially distanced manner. Uh, and we will also look to see whether there are options to increase that capacity. So, uh, and, and we will, as you've said, need to look to see how we can make better use of, of technology as well, provided that the, the appellants are, are suitably supported through that process. So, so it, I think it will be a very different model going forward for tribunals, um, but I wouldn't want to cut off any, any particular uh, option. In relation to the uh, public scrutiny uh, and media scrutiny of, of cases going forward, um, yes, I, I think that we, we, we will, again, as, as part of the, the current arrangements, look to see how we can stream um, proceedings to allow interested parties to see them. Uh, that, that has been particularly prominent in relation to the, the planning work that we're doing around jury trial. Um, we, we know uh, from what colleagues have done in other jurisdictions that uh, it's not uncommon for a jury trial now to take up three courtrooms. Uh, you have the, the jury and the parties socially distanced spread out in, in one courtroom. You have a second courtroom in which maybe other witnesses, family members, interested parties, media can sit and will be able to see the proceedings live streamed into, into that courtroom. Um, and then a third courtroom or large room set aside for the jury whenever they need to go out to deliberate. So, so we do have a focus on, on how we can make sure that people can still view proceedings. Um, there, I, th I think there would be a legislative impediment to broadcasting courts, um, but, but, but we're very alive to the fact that we need to make sure that those people who need to see it still have an opportunity to see it. Um, and, and, and that will cut across all relevant court proceedings, not, not just jury trials. Thank you, thank you. Linda? Just a of questions. First of all, just on the back of, of the issues that have already been raised around the tribunal hearings, I think maybe one of the difficulties, I mean, Sinead raised a couple of organisations there, and they are excellent in terms of preparing cases, but actually going with the individual to the hearings, they're not. And I find that that usually lands at our doorstep or the doorstep of other community and voluntary organisations okay. um, or non-stats that, that end up having to, to pick that end of it up. So my concern is that whilst those organisations are really good at preparing, then where an individual is asked to come in by video conferencing, if they don't have a representative who is attending with them, that person very, very often, and very often due to the nature of their own difficulties, whether that is... Um, mental health or learning difficulties or whatever that might be or their physical impediments won't be able to manage doing the video conference themselves without help 
So I think that there need, is a piece of work that needs to be done to find out why the uptake on video conferencing is so low because it's something that pro- potentially would work particularly for the likes of myself who, who does and other elect reps who does actually go to these hearings with people. If I was doing that for them in my office, it would mean we're potentially half a day is the least it will ever take you at a tribunal because they never run on time. Um, and you're sitting there for hours on end. I could be continuing to work in my office until the video conference needs to start. So it actually potentially could be beneficial to the advocate. So And, and I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting that we need to ensure because it's not the advocate who's the priority here. Yep. It is the, the individual who's the appellant. But obviously what, what, what allows them to have an advocate is going to be beneficial to them as well. So I think we needed to, there needs to be a piece of work done around that. Just in terms of the live streaming from courts, and it's just whenever she, as Sinead asked that and you answered, it came into my head. So there's a courtroom being used for people who want to view court proceedings. And I understand what you're saying about not having live streaming out in the public broadcast. But is there not um, a way of live streaming it to another building rather than using an additional courtroom just for people who want to view proceedings? That's not to take away from there, their there importance. Is. That's why I'm saying yeah. that... that you know, if we can find another way, uh, there, there, there is, and, and we have done that before in, in, in very specific circumstances. I, I, I remember one particularly high profile case where uh, we set up a room in headline buildings, uh, which, which the, the family and interested parties went and, and viewed the, the proceedings from. Um, so, so that is possible. And again, if rather, rather than taking up valuable court space, that may well be part of the, the solution. So, I just as, again, as I say around the tribunal stuff, I think it's important that that. that piece of work is done because like Sinead, I un- I understand what you're saying around the court service or the court buildings being used and that they're used for many other things other than just for, for criminal cases. But the reality is many of the parents that we're bringing to these hearings have never put their foot inside a court and the only knowledge they have of a court is what they see on the TV. So it, it's very hard to get past that, you know, in terms of, of their, their own thinking. One last question, just in terms of the, the family courts, and, and again, that's already been raised by Paul. Have you noticed an increase in, in I suppose, families having to come to court around COVID-related issues? And that is, because I've, I've had a number of these come to me where parents have been staying, I suppose, not putting in place what the guidelines that the Lord Chief Justice has given out around the fact that two homes should behave as one where there is shared custody or where there are access arrangements and where one parent is saying no there's there's symptoms in my home the child can't go to you are you finding that there's an increase in, in those types of um, cases I, I, we, we have certainly time. had some of those cases coming in uh, I, th- I think there has been a, a lot of work done by uh, legal representatives with their clients to try and address some of those issues outside of, of the court setting and, and to try and almost uh, broker a settlement um, and, and uh, I think that that is something that is, is being used to good effect um, for, for those families who are involved with, with social services again I, I am aware anecdotally of, of, of social workers trying to address conflict around contact uh, as well so uh, we, we have had some cases coming in and, and whenever we look at the, the number of cases received and, and cases disposed of against the, the, the same uh, period last year uh, there's, there's certainly a reduction, but, but there's still a, a, a considerable number of cases coming in. Um, so, so that, that, that uh, flow is, is still coming through. Um, in relation to the domestic violence side of things, I, I know that we had a, a query recently about um, whether there had been a, a substantial drop in, in the number of applications for non-molestation orders because of the perception that the, the courts weren't accessible. Uh, but whenever we actually pulled those numbers out, the, the, the figures were largely comparable uh, for, for the same period last year. Any other members? Chair, just on the um, historical abuse scheme, which is making progress, uh, the panels have met. They have. Um, we the, obviously the, the decision on, on whether to go live on this uh, was, was for uh, the first and deputy first minister, uh, and, and there were some very uh, candid discussions about the, the practical constraints of doing so at yes. a time of, of lockdown. Um, but but there was a, there was a real desire to see that system uh, go live and, and come on board. We we did think that maybe 
in the early stages, our ability would be to receive applications, but maybe not do an awful lot more with them. But but the the president and, and the panel members have worked with us really well. Have been very receptive to the idea of, of meeting virtually to consider completed cases, uh, and that has been done. And we, we've got to the point where the panels have have made uh, a, a, a number of awards, either interim payments or full payments, uh, and those have now been uh, processed through to, to payment. So, it, I, I think in the circumstances, it's been a, a real result. Good. Where is that based? It's in Headline. Uh, the redress board itself sits in in, in Headline buildings. Um, okay. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Okay, Peter, um, can I thank you very much for coming to the committee today? As always, much appreciated. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Members, we're going to take a short comfort break and recommence at one o'clock. Thank you. And we will hopefully then. You say two o'clock? No. No, well, one, five, five minutes, Gordon. All right, so we'll, we'll reconvene at one o'clock, members. Committee room 30. Okay. okay, members, um, that's us back live for the Justice Committee. Um, we're moving to the next item on the agenda, which is the uh, proposals to commence the devolved provisions that relate to Northern Ireland in the Criminal Finances Act 2017. Um, we've got some witnesses that are dialing in and some that are here uh, in uh, person. The principal purpose of the Act is to make legislative provision to provide law enforcement agencies and partners with new capabilities and powers to recover the proceeds of crime and to tackle money laundering, corruption and terrorist finance. The Act has been fully commenced in England, Wales and Scotland. Uh, in Northern Ireland, only those provisions that relate wholly uh, to reserved or expected matters have been commenced. The commencement of the outstanding provisions will ensure that law enforcement agencies can avail of a full range of enhanced tools to support work to disrupt serious and organised crime and remove the proceeds of crime. The relevant uh, papers for members are pages 56 to 79 of your meeting pack. So can I welcome uh, Cathy Galway, Deputy Director of Protection and Organised Crime Division in the Department of Justice, and Andrea Watson, who is Acting Head of Organised Crime Branch from the Department of Justice. Um, and we have Patrick Crothers, Senior Lawyer, um, and the legal of National Crime Agency and also Detective Chief, uh, Chief Superintendent uh, Darren Evans from the Police Service of Northern Ireland, both of whom are on the teleconference. Um, ju just to advise um, members, the session will be recorded by Hansard and then it will be published on the committee webpage in due course. So, um, Cathy, I'm going to now invite you uh, to take us through uh, the relevant areas. Thank okay. you, Cathy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're very grateful for the opportunity to brief the committee today about the commencement of the relevant provisions of the Criminal Finances Act 2017 in Northern Ireland. Um, as you say, Andrea and I are here, and we have Patrick and Darren, uh, albeit remotely, who will be happy to answer any queries the committee may have on the current enforcement tools and powers for asset recovery in Northern Ireland. Chair, from the briefing note that we have shared with the committee, you will be aware that the Criminal Finances Act extends to Northern Ireland, but a significant number of the provisions have not been commenced yet. The Act is in four parts, covering the proceeds of crime, terrorist property, corporate offences of failure to prevent tax evasion, and general amendments. Most of the outstanding provisions relate to the proceeds of crime, money laundering, civil recovery, enforcement powers, and related offences, and creates a new range of powers for law enforcement agencies to request information, seize money stored in bank accounts and mobile stores of value. The provisions amend and add to the powers already available on a UK-wide basis under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. This strengthens the existing provisions within the Proceeds of Crime Act to ensure that law enforcement agencies and authorities have effective legal powers to deal with the threat posed by serious organised crime and to ensure that its application in Northern Ireland is consistent with its application in the rest of the UK. Disrupting and preventing those seeking to move, hide or use the proceeds of crime or corruption is a key objective of government and the Justice Minister has stated that commencing the provisions of the Criminal Finances Act in Northern Ireland is one of her key priorities. Uh, both the Minister and the Permanent Secretary of the Department indicated in their introductory meetings with the Committee the intention is to work towards commencement by the end of 2020. The Minister has recently written both to you, Chair, and the Executive colleagues, signalling her intention to seek commencement of these provisions with support from colleagues. 
The Minister has also indicated that she intends to write to the Home Secretary to ask her to commence the relevant provisions and to progress the supporting work that underpins the commencement of those provisions in Northern Ireland as soon as possible. If it's helpful, I'd like to just set out a bit of background um, to, the, uh, to the Act and the briefing paper provides additional detail on the background to the inclusion of provisions in respect of Northern Ireland. And Chair, as you will see from the paper and as I have outlined, the provisions do relate to a mix of reserved matters, terrorist financing and tax, and devolved matters, asset recovery and powers to recover the proceeds of crime. A legislative consent motion is the usual process by which the Assembly indicates that it's content for UK Parliament to pass a law on a devolved matter. The previous executive agreed to the extension to Northern Ireland of certain provisions of the Home Office's Criminal Finances Bill and to the tabling of an appropriate legislative consent motion in the Assembly. A draft legislative consent memorandum was considered and approved by both the Justice Committee and the Executive in 2016. The memorandum was laid at the Assembly Business Office, but the debate on the legislative consent motion was not possible before the Assembly was dissolved in January 2017. So although appropriate steps were taken in December 2016 for the consent of the Assembly to the relevant provisions in the Bill and that they would extend to Northern Ireland, these could not be finalised. The UK Government decided that the devolved provisions should remain in the Bill with commencement of the Act at different dates in different jurisdictions. The provisions that have not been commenced in Northern Ireland are set out at paragraphs 8 and 9 of the briefing paper. And the paper explains that the Home Office ministers took the decision to keep all of the proposed provisions within the Bill, but that those commencement of provisions touching on devolved competence in Northern Ireland would be held until the necessary consents were in place. We have sought advice on how to proceed in these circumstances, that is, where there is legislation now enacted, um, and we have been advised that there is no established protocol for seeking retrospective consent to the provisions of an Act of Parliament um, that extends to Northern Ireland. And the Committee will be aware of a similar scenario in respect of the Crime Overseas Production Orders Act 2019. The Home Secretary and the Department of Justice are empowered under the Act to commence the provisions in Northern Ireland by regulation. And there have been white calls for the full commencement of the provisions so that they are available to operational enforcement agencies, in particular the provisions for unexplained wealth orders, account forfeiture and listed assets. Since the return of the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Department has been working with the Home Office and with colleagues in other departments to scope out the steps required to deliver the commencement of the outstanding provisions. The progress of commencing the provisions in the Act will be taken forward in the main by the Home Office on behalf of the Home Secretary by regulations. The Department of Justice will commence four provisions at the Northern Ireland Assembly, again by regulations. Following the request to the Home Secretary from the Justice Minister, as outlined in the letter to the Committee, the Home Office will begin the process of commencement and will work to a single commencement date for all the provisions in the Act that fall to the Home Secretary to commence. Setting a commencement date later in 2020 is necessary as guidance needs to be published on the new provisions under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, Codes of Practice. There will be public consultation <coughs> excuse me, on the nine codes of practice, four issued by the Department, four by the Home Office and one by the Attorney General of England and Wales. And we hope to return to the Committee for scrutiny of the Northern Ireland Codes of Practice after the summer recess. This will involve a complex programme of work in collaboration with the Home Office and additionally the Department will be developing instructions for Northern Ireland Court rules. The lead in time will give law enforcement an opportunity to prepare for the commencement of the new provisions and take forward any necessary training. The commencement of the le legislative provisions is an important step in enhancing Northern Ireland's law enforcement response to tackling money laundering and recovering the proceeds of crime. The Minister has indicated that she intends to issue a written statement to the Northern Ireland Assembly to inform members about the decision to progress the commencement of the relevant provisions both of Criminal Finances Act and of the Crime Overseas Production Orders. I hope I have provided the context for the Criminal Finance Act and outlined the proposed process for commencement. I'll stop there, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions member may, members may have on the commencement of these provisions. Okay, thank you, Cathy, and that's been very helpful by way of giving us a, an overview of what it is that um, the Department are, are wishing to do. Um, some just procedural questions in terms of giving effect then to the regulations. You've mentioned that there's no established protocol for retrospectively commencing this. So, how? Are they going to be processed in terms of the actual regulations? Will it be through an LCM, albeit that should have happened whenever it was going through Westminster? Will it be uh, an affirmative type vote in the Assembly on this? or What, what, what is the process mm -hmm. that the Department think it will have to follow? So uh, there's a range um, 
for the commencement orders, they are made. So the commencement orders are made, and for the um, for the standing order for the court rules, it's by affirmative resolution. And I'll bring Andrea in for some of the detail on this. And then for the Home Office regulations to commence, they're made. And for other uh, regulations, they are made through affirmative procedure. So it's a mix, actually. But the LCM is really a process whereby, as a bill is going it's through, going legislative consent is granted for provisions in the bill. As the Act is now, as it is an Act now, it's enacted, actually the LCM process isn't the process through which you would gain consent yeah. and that's why the Minister has written to ministerial colleagues and to the committee to say, you know, we can commence these and the Minister does have, the, the Department of Justice and the Home Office have the powers within the Act to commence the provisions. Andrea, do you want to give a bit more information on yeah, no, the process? Um, so yes, as Cathy said, it's just commencement by commencement regulations. So the, the department here is empowered to commence four small provisions of the Act and the re other remaining provisions will be commenced by regulations by the Home Secretary. So there's no parliamentary or assembly <coughs> control for those commencement regulations. Okay. What are the regulations then? Obviously, the Assembly and the Department of Justice put down an affirmative commencement regulation that gives us kind of oversight of that and a rule. Sure. The rule then that we would have for the Home Secretary laying down commencement regulations. So that would be no, no, no rule no for the committee here and no rule for the Assembly. Um, the same. That, sorry. Sorry for cutting across you. No, that's fine. And, and does the Home Secretary? lay commencement regulations on areas that are devolved? Yeah, um, y yes, she will be laying commencement regulations on provisions that were included in the original legislative consent memorandum that we that we previously um, tried to progress. So yes, um, some of those provisions are totally devolved. Um, some of them are, are a mix of devolved and re reserved responsibilities. And some of the reserve responsibilities cut across devolved competence and involve um, work that the PSNI, for example, will be taking forward. So um, that was the reason for seeking the consent um, when that was possible um, in 2016 and 2017. Okay. Um, and has there been any thought given then as to how the department could get a view from the committee or the assembly, f so that, albeit if we have no role, even as a indicative consultative role, that we're able to, to do that. Well, as part of today, you know, coming today and, and, and having this session is to explain the, the Criminal Finances Act and the provisions as they would um, apply when commenced. Um, there will be a role uh, for the for the committee and the assembly whenever codes of practice are being put together and it would be our intention to come back to the committee <coughs> to consult with the committee on those codes of practice and also on on the court rules there will be some actions by affirmative yeah we would share the we'd share the court rule um, instruments mm -hmm. with the committee before they're laid and they'd be laid by negative mm -hmm. resolution so the, the assembly would consider them at that mm -hmm. point yeah. um, um and the, the the code of conduct that that um, relates to the implementation then and, mm -hmm. and who has the authority and how that should be handled and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Um, the, the unexplained wealth orders, um, I know at the start there was some debate around the threshold of it being at 50,000 and mm -hmm. 100,000 and, and yes. it, mm -hmm. it, it was then I think reduced and at 50,000 is the figure. Yes, that's right. And okay. that was after the committee and uh, various um, during the, proce the process of the bill, um, the, the committee had asked for that to be reduced, and I think the PSNI had asked for that to be reduced to 50,000 as well. So it's now 50,000. Yeah, no, I had read that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's applicable across the UK. It's 50,000 is, the, is the, the threshold for this. And I know there was some discussion then around oversight of the implementation of this, um, some human rights aspects of it. Um, and then would there be any judicial oversight, for mm -hmm. example, in respect of the unexplained wealth orders being issued? Mm -hmm. Can you just talk me through yes. that aspect mm -hmm. of it? Yeah, so there, there is judicial oversight of the unexplained wealth orders. There is a process that's followed. Um, and Patrick might want <coughs> to come in and give sort of the legal, the NCA's view on this. But um, 
to to have to I have to be granted an unexplained wealth order by the High Court. So maybe Patrick could give us the detail on how that would operate. Yes, um, good afternoon. Uh, in, in relation to applications for unexplained wealth orders, there are, of course, um, statutory requirements and statutory thresholds that have to be made uh, and met uh, in, in every application. Every application is, of course, subject to judicial scrutiny uh, at the highest level, at high court level. And uh, obviously, if, if a high court judge is not satisfied uh, that uh, the statutory thresholds have been met, then an order will not actually be made. So, uh, you know, the, the, the process uh, has scrutin judicial scrutiny at its heart. That's helpful. Um, obviously, the, the aspects of this has already been in play here in respect of terrorist financing. But one of the one of one of the the issues that people raise that these unexplained wealth orders will be able to go after paramilitaries. But is that not already the case? So therefore, is there a change in terms of introducing unexplained wealth orders by way of targeting paramilitary organisations through that approach? Well, Chair, if I could just say, <clears throat> unexplained wealth orders, it's a, it's a civil case. Um, there's obviously the PSNI can still um, confiscate and, and um, cover the proceeds of crime when there's a criminal conviction. And maybe, you know, Darren and I had talked about this this morning, you know, maybe Darren could come in there in terms of the role of the PSNI, because the PSNI doesn't actually have a role in, in unexplained wealth orders other than they can refer another uh, authority to take them forward. So maybe Darren could explain the role of the PSNI there and what is already happening operationally for the proceeds of crime through tackling paramilitaries. Darren? Yep, Chair. Uh, hopefully you can hear me OK. It's, it's a difficult line. Yes, I can hear you. We, we can hear you, no problem, Darren. Right, OK. So, yes, uh, as Cathy was saying there, so from a PSNI perspective, obviously we do have powers under the Proceeds of Crime Act, uh, and we do utilise those. Now, pro probably the point to draw in here as well is we do uh, rely upon the broader partnership base to support that as well with the NCA and HMRC and other partners. So, yes, we will... Uh, make seizures uh, in terms of criminal assets that we come across, and particularly in paramilitary investigations. Uh, the difference with the unexplained wealth orders is obviously we have to get to court, we have to prosecute an individual, and then off the back of that, we make an application in terms of the confiscation aspect. So uh, we have the ability with an unexplained wealth order, obviously from a civil perspective, to make that. Uh, referral to our partners in the NCA, so where there is a lesser burden of proof required. And if I, if I can just ask, who is it primarily that this is being targeted at then? Where do you see the main kind of area of crime where pe people currently are able to, to have their unexplained wealth taken from them. Who, who are the type of people that we're going after here? Beyond, uh, obviously, criminals, that's the obvious one, but is there a particular sector, that section that's slipping through the net? Uh, we would be looking at as broad a sense there. So uh, that would be across all of where we see organised crime being uh, committed right across Northern Ireland and indeed outside of the borders of Northern Ireland as well. So. Uh, it would not be limited to any particular section or area of crime. It would be in its broadest sense. Okay, and, and how, how do you deal with the person that's operating in cash, for example? Obviously, if a significant amount of money appears in somebody's bank account, that probably already under current systems are being flagged up and, and can be looked at. But if you can just talk me through how you're actually going to get the evidence trail to, to be able to pull together an order. Yeah, so we will follow the money. So obviously we can uh, go for an account freezing order in that regard. And uh, we will look to see where the money has come from. 
the the benefit with the unexplained wealth order as it stands uh, is that it, the burden of proof falls on the respondent on the individual themselves to prove where that asset or that money has originated from um, so that would take the burden away from either the police uh, or other partners and uh, would put it on the individual themselves but for us as it stands at present time we follow the money to where that may have originated from thank you Darren that, that was helpful um, Rachel yeah thank you chair um, I have a number of questions on this but I'll try and stick to a few of them and work tight for time in terms of these is this uh, the, sort of the provisions within um, these sections, is this specifically for uh, the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom? Is there any sort of different territories that this can apply to? Basically, does it just cover operations within the UK or is this within Europe or any other countries? Is there any kind of like agreements or anything on this from elsewhere? Say if somebody was, um, money was being put into bank accounts overseas and vice versa, especially with the tax evasion section on that as well. Mm -hmm. Is there any information? Is it just here? So the the act extends to the UK, um, but there are uh, provisions in it that uh, allow, uh, and I will bring Patrick in on this as well, that will um, allow to look at crown dependencies in overseas territories and money that's held in accounts there. Um, and so the the provisions the the provisions that we are bringing in that we hope to bring in and commence will allow the UK as a whole to operate these provisions, but there are um, elements of this that allows um, accounts to be looked at in overseas territories and the Crown Dependencies of Guernsey, Jersey and the Isle of Man. Um, maybe Patrick would like to say a bit more about your particular question about the reach of it. Um, yes, in relation to uh, jurisdiction, um, these non-conviction based um, asset recovery provisions um, can extend outside the jurisdiction of Northern Ireland and indeed outside the jurisdiction of the UK, but they are of course subject to uh, the, the laws of the, the, the land where the asset or the money might actually be uh, located. So um, th there is a um, uh, concerted effort on the, on the part of law enforcement to develop um, you know, working partnerships with law enforcement in other jurisdictions uh, to ensure that, that um, if assets are located outside the UK or indeed outside uh, Northern Ireland, uh, that uh, some jurisdictions will actually then uh, freeze and indeed then recover uh, those assets and those monies can be repatriated uh, in theory. However, uh, it, 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 it can be quite difficult because obviously with with the, the, the myriad uh, different uh, legal processes in different jurisdictions, you, you're not always able to find an analogous regime. Uh, but but uh, in relation to actual investigations themselves, um, there, there is an awful lot of cooperation goes on between uh, jurisdictions. And the, the issue around um, unexplained wealth orders in particular, but uh, uh, as they are a microcosm of civil recovery proceedings uh, as a whole, the, the issue there uh, is that provided there is a connection uh, to the jurisdiction making the order, i.e. be it Northern Ireland or be it the UK, provided there is a, a connection, uh, then uh, civil recovery uh, has extra jurisdictional reach, but it does depend on the other jurisdiction for the enforcement of any order. No, I think that's certainly something I would like to get more detail on, just yes, obviously we, we know that and, um, money transfers don't just happen within the jurisdiction mm -hmm. and if there, yes. it would be good to, to get some more information on mm -hmm. how that's even working in the rest of the UK that have already had this in mm -hmm. for some time. Mm -hmm. um, I just would like to clarify what law enforcement agencies are we discussing here with these provisions? Um, it's to the police, NCA, who, who are we talking mm -hmm. about HMRC? So it, there, are, there are different law enforcement authorities for the different types of provisions. So for example with the unexplained wealth orders, it's, it's not the PSNI. Um, and the, the uh, enforcement authorities are listed uh, in in the um, in the provisions. Um, for other provisions, it it does include police officers. So, uh, 
I can get you more detail on those and, and write to you, but it is set out in the legislation. But it is, um, Andrea, do you want to pick up on the enforcement agencies for the sure. unexplained wealth orders? Um, so for the unexplained wealth orders, um, the NCI will have um, the powers, uh, HMRC, the Serious Fraud Office, the Financial Conduct Authority, and the powers will also be designated are also designated to the Director of Public Prosecutions, England and Wales, and the Director of Public Prosecutions public prosecutions here in Northern Ireland. Um, we envisage NCI will be the main agency in Northern Ireland for taking forward the UWO, um, the UWO any UWOs that would come forward. Um, when you're talking about um, confiscation and cash seizures, yes, the range of law enforcement agencies um, have those powers. Um, when it comes to confiscation, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency is another agency as part of the Department of Agriculture that has powers um, to take forward uh, confiscation work post-criminal conviction. So there, there's quite a range. Department for Communities on the fraud um, benefit fraud and side also would have the conf parts of confiscation. So they'll be interested in some of the changes um, that are that are being brought in um, and amending POCA through the Criminal Finances Act. Okay, brilliant. Um, so it's sort of a very wide ranging group of people and obviously there would need to be guidance issued for all of those um, organisations then after, during this. And after. So that's what the codes, the codes mm -hmm. of practice cover. The codes of practice for the Proceeds of Crime Act cover the guidance of all of these operational powers. So th there's a big pro programme of work to amend these codes now and um, the committee will see the Northern Ireland codes. Um, they will be subject to affirmative order at the assembly so there will be full assembly scrutiny on the codes of practice which provide the operational guidance on the proper use of the powers as legislated. Brilliant and finally just in terms of a practical outworking of this obviously we have the proceeds of crime going into schemes like assets recovery scheme which you know community groups and so on can apply to would that be sort of something that could, is similar you know if the outworkings of this and the um, and how is confiscated underneath that is that a similar process that um, could be used? Yes, the assets recovered will go into the consolidated fund and then that fund is used, um, some of it is used to compensate the victims of crime, some of it is used um, and goes back to the enforcement agencies that um, were successful in, in, in securing the, 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 the recovery of the assets and some of it then is distributed by the Department of Justice through the um, Asset Recovery Community Scheme. So it's a range of things that can happen um, with the money that comes back in. But really, asset recovery is a response. So the primary purpose is not to generate revenue to be redistributed. It's the primary purpose is to disrupt criminal activity and to stop criminals from having access to funds to enhance their um, criminal activity. And um, again, discussed this with PSNI colleagues this morning. You know, the asset recovery is a tool. Um, and it's a response, but it, it generating the income is not really the primary purpose, but it does serve a purpose. Yeah, when it's recovered. absolutely. I understand mm -hmm. that. Thank you. And is it the Attorney General in England and Wales that has been advising on the code of conduct aspects? You, you'd mentioned the the AG having a role in England and Wales. I just wanted to get the context of that again. Um, the new um, UWO provisions um, guidance has been. Um, inserted on those into a code of practice that the Attorney General of England and Wales who also holds the position of Advocate General for Northern Ireland so that one code covers England and Wales and Northern Ireland so there'll be um, uh, once the UWO provisions are commenced in Northern Ireland that code will be amended by the England and Wales Attorney General's Office um, to take account of the powers being uh, commenced in Northern Ireland. Okay. Because I know the Attorney General in Northern Ireland has a role to provide Section 8 guidance around human rights for criminal justice organisations, so I'm just wanting to know if there was an interface with that office. Uh, so once when the codes are being consulted upon, we will publicly consult on the codes and the department will write directly to the Attorney General in Northern Ireland and make sure he's cited on all the various codes. And um... Okay. Um, is there a figure in mind at the minute as to how many of these orders could be in place once it becomes live. <coughs> if, if this tool was available to the police service and these other bodies now, 
how many would be issued? Has that, has that been... Well, actually, um, Patrick might come in there because he'd be able to uh, set out what what has happened in um, in the other jurisdictions where these... Yes, yes uh, Chair. Uh, if, if I can set this just in a little bit of short context, um, the, the provisions under, under uh, the Criminal Finances Act that the Minister seeks to, to bring in are primarily dealing uh, with, with uh, financial crime. And uh, as the committee will be aware, financial profit is at the heart of almost all forms of serious and organised crime, including paramilitary crime. These are crimes that directly affect the most vulnerable in, in, in Northern Ireland society. The current provisions uh, that law enforcement in Northern Ireland um, operates under uh, enable us to take action against criminal cash and then the big assets such as houses and helicopters and the like. But increasingly, since, uh, since certainly since 2002 when the Proceeds of Crime Act came in uh, to date, criminals have become increasingly sophisticated in finding alternative ways to launder the proceeds of the crime and indeed by laundering it to fund further criminal activity. And effectively, they'll use any mechanism uh, to hold and move illicit funds uh, and certainly the use of bank accounts, uh, precious metals, jewellery and, and uh, even very expensive watches uh, has become uh, increasingly common. The, the provisions that we're talking about here within, within the act that the Minister is seeking to, to commence will bridge uh, the gap by enabling the seizure and forfeiture of such items. Uh, and in particular, the, the ability to freeze and forfeit uh, the proceeds of crime that are held in bank accounts, that will, will not only address the concerns that are being raised by the regulated sector, uh, particularly banks, who have a statutory obligation, of course, to support, uh, to report suspicious activity, but, but it will also ensure that law enforcement can take swift law enforcement action uh, to disrupt criminal uh, uh, money laundering activity. I mean, while, while we want to, to all maximise the recovery of criminal assets, I think that, that it's very important to recognise that the real value of going after the money, uh, or indeed the assets, uh, does actually come from its disruptive effects on the criminality. By, by targeting criminal money flows, uh, you, you can remove the criminal working capital, you can uh, unpick uh, derail conspiracies, you prevent further crimes taking place, and you can certainly damage criminals' reputations with each other and within their own communities and connect uh, the, the, the higher level godfathers, as it were, to, and the enablers to, to the crimes that are maybe being committed by lower level uh, activists. Um, what, what these provisions will do will, will bring into line on a, a level playing field uh, the, the ability of, for law enforcement in Northern Ireland to uh, collaborate with law enforcement uh, in, in Great Britain uh, because, of course, organised crime uh, it doesn't have any respect for borders whatsoever. Um, so th that, that, that means that, that we can actually have a joined-up approach to, to dealing with these some things. Um, the, the, there's been a certain amount of focus on unexplained uh, wealth orders um, at this point in time, uh, and I suppose that, that what, what I would like to just maybe clarify uh, is that an unexplained wealth order, does, it's, it's not an, a means to an end in itself. What it's actually doing is it's uh, enhancing uh, the existing powers to do with civil recovery. And the, the, what the, the, the object of unexplained wealth orders essentially is, is to, uh, is, is to capture evidence that would otherwise be unavailable, perhaps because that evidence lies outside the jurisdiction, uh, or to, to, um, to, to, to link people who maybe are sitting with, with vast property portfolios, um, but no connection to uh, unlawful conduct, save that they maybe are connected to someone who is involved in unlawful conduct. And th 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 these investigative orders are, are only investigative orders. And um, obviously they allow an enforcement authority like the, the NCA to assess whether in actual fact there is a viable civil recovery case to be taken forward uh, thereafter. So, uh, as I say, the, in, 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 the, in sort of the, the, the wider context of, of how these things have actually played out in uh, the past year since commencement uh, in, in GB, um, the vast focus 
uh, has been very much on uh, the uh, account freezing and forfeiture applications and indeed the listed as asset applications. So uh, the, the, up, up to the 30th of April of this year, and this is uh, covering all law enforcement bodies, there have been 1,519 uh, applications made for account freezing orders. And then in relation to applications for listed assets, for freezing listed assets, there have been 131 applications made. Now, in terms of the amounts frozen in bank accounts, it's in excess of £300 million. Now, some, some particular cases will skew those figures, uh, given that the, the statutory threshold for freezing is only £1,000. In relation to the listed assets cases, there's about £12.5 million worth of listed assets that are currently frozen and uh, awaiting forfeiture applications. In contrast, in respect of unexplained wealth order applications, there have to date only been four made before the High Court uh, in, in London. Um, uh, two of those have been on the basis of um, uh, PEP applications or politically exposed person applications. So that, that would be in the context of where um, assets uh, belonging to perhaps a, 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 a person who has been in a position of authority in, in, a, in a foreign state uh, have been located in, in uh, the UK. Um, those are investigations into those types of cases. Uh, two other cases uh, involve serious organized crime and um, w without obviously uh, speculating as to um, you know whether there will be PEP cases in Northern Ireland or whether it will be serious organized crime type cases in Northern Ireland I, I think uh, one has to be realistic that um, there is already a suite of investigative orders in part eight uh, of the Act, and this is just but one more of those investigative orders that tries to fill those gaps and enhance the capability of law enforcement to uh, pursue non-conviction based uh, outcomes uh, to recover the proceeds of crime. Thanks Darren, that, that's very helpful. Can, can I just clarify a couple of points on that? The, the figures you gave there for freezing, um, the application for freezing accounts and the assets cases, that's across, that's in GB? That, that is purely on in GB because at this point in time uh, law enforcement in Northern Ireland uh, are not able to access those. The, the law enforcement in, in Northern Ireland, particularly PSNI, have of course uh, been playing a role uh, with uh, the National Economic uh, Crime Centre um, and, and so are well advanced in, in terms of their preparation uh, to actually be, be hit the ground running in the use of these, these additional powers. Can, can you tell me, is that from the introduction of the powers being made available to GB and, and when was that? So the, the, the powers were introduced, they effectively got up and running. Uh, the, the Act is, is dated 2017, but it was effectively the beginning, uh, sort of 2018 going forwards. So th that is from commencement uh, of the Act up to the 30th of April of this year. Okay, now that's, that's very helpful because obviously, correct me there, you said that there's only been four unexplained wealth orders brought to the High Court in London? That, that's correct. There are a number of other uh, cases uh, that, that are in scoping. Um, the, the, the cases that involve uh, other jurisdictions, uh, as, as you perhaps can imagine, um, are quite, um, quite involved and um, you know, quite complicated, particularly um, where, where most of the evidence is going to lie offshore and will be um, uh, opaque uh, through uh, use of, of complex trust st structures, etc. So th there is a lot of work going on, uh, but, but as I say, they, they are not the, they're not the panacea um, to, to, to uh, bringing these matters forward. They enhance our capability and uh, the, the civil recovery arena and uh, orders obtained to recover uh, proceeds of crime in that manner is, is still very healthy and, um, you know, as I say, it's an enhancement as opposed to an alternative. Okay, no, thank you. That's, that's very helpful, Darren. Um, Linda? Okay, thank you to all of you for your um, main questions. Some of them are technical. Um, 
we had actually, as the policing board, been to a presentation that Darren actually was part of in terms of explaining. So I have a fair understanding of, of the unexplained violence orders and this particular legislation just around what it is hoped that it will enable PSNA and other partner agencies to do. Can I just ask a few questions? One is around the first one actually, see the list that, that Rachel talked about of and, you, and you've said that some of these orders will actually apply to other departments, so for example the Department for Communities and mm -hmm. and DARA and other departments. Will other departments then also be involved in scru scrutinising those codes of practice or is that going to just come to this committee? Um, we'll, we'll run a public consultation mm -hmm. on the codes, so we'll send them out widely and okay. um, so okay. they would have an opportunity. Um, we'll also do some more targeted consultation with the partners of the Organised Crime Task Force and all of those agencies would be represented on the Criminal Finance Group. It's a subgroup of the Organised Crime Task Force. So um, yes, we'll make sure that we widely consult on, on those votes. Does that include the 26 counties? Does that include, are they part of that group or no? No, that's a Northern Ireland. That's the organised crime task forces. Um, Northern Ireland agencies operating in Northern Ireland. Um, the Angardish Kana would sit on some of the subgroups. They'd be represented on the Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking subgroup. Um, they're not on that Criminal Finances subgroup. Okay. Um, so then, just in relation to um, Part Four, Section Eleven. Are there any limitations on what information can be shared? So it talks about makes provision for the voluntary sharing of information between bodies in the regulated sector. Now I'm assuming the regulated sector is the banks, the credit unions, the all those financial places where people may try to hide their money. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> the, yes. the mm -hmm. one person speak for it. So that, that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the regulated sector. So is, is there, are there any limitations then on what information can be shared? Or is it simply it's out there? Whatever information they hold on a person can be shared with. I think there are so. so um, it is. This does bring in um, provisions to allow for sharing, and it also um, allows for sharing of information in certain cases. But again, Patrick might be able to come in where there are in, where there are some instances where there is a legal. Um, privilege, you know, the client privilege, um, but generally these are to enable information to be shared. But I'll just bring Patrick in there at that point if there are any issues with sharing information in terms of legal privilege. Um, no, I, 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 and I'm, I'm not sure whether the, the question was... I'm not sure whether the, the question was focused on uh, the information sharing uh, that would go on uh, by members of the regulated sector or the information sharing uh, that would maybe be in the context of uh, any of the um, asset forfeiture provisions. But in, in relation to the first, um, what, what this aims, I believe, to, to uh, plug a gap, if you like, is that you have uh, different banks who are being used by uh, the same uh, organized crime grouping, um, and th they uh, need to find a way to actually communicate with each other, um, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, maybe m making some sort of um, assessment of activity and account. Uh, that assessment might be very different if they knew that, that um, three other banks, for example, were, were being used in the exact same way. Currently, um, the, what would have to happen would be that someone else would have to be joining up the pieces, and that would be the financial intelligence unit uh, within the National Crime Agency to whom suspicious activity reports are submitted. Um, there has been a joint money laundering intelligence task force uh, set up over the past number of years, and that, that is allowing uh, a greater amount of uh, uh, sort of information sharing or intelligence sharing. This place, this will place it uh, on a, a legal footing, uh, so that the regulated sector uh, and those in law enforcement uh, can actually have better uh, lines of communication. In relation to uh, the actual um, forfeiture orders themselves, um, 
the 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 the, the concept of confidentiality um, is 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 there in in the legislation, and in particular, uh, the you know um, none of these uh, types of investigations uh, require a person to answer any privileged question or to produce privileged or excluded material, um, you know, in, in that regard. Uh, so the, the, the protections are built in within the legislation to ensure, uh, as I say, that, that, that uh, privilege, legal privilege, is respected. Um, okay. Just then, in relation to Section 17, serious fraud officers, so this grants the fraud of office officers direct access to asset preservation powers in confiscation okay. proceedings recovery of cash and investigatory powers. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm thinking that those, obviously though, well, those aren't currently in, in the hands of officers, but does anybody currently have those powers and now they're just transferring to? Uh, th th those powers exist with, with the National Crime Agency and uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions for Northern Ireland as enforcement authorities. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so any other members? Thanks, Chair. Just a point. There's obviously a lot of work to be done here, and uh, do, does the necessary resources uh, are they in place once this new legislation comes into being? Uh, to well, obviously within the PSNI, within legal services, to get on with the, the job, which has been highlighted today, and. I think we're all very much aware of the extent of it and how much has to be done in relation to implementing the, the Act once it's finalised and getting real results from it. Well, um, because uh, an awful lot of this is already building on powers that exist in uh, the Proceeds of Crime Act, then the, uh, the structures are there. Um, in terms of the capacity of the PSNI, I think I would bring Darren in at that point to, to highlight yeah. whether there's any capacity issues once these provisions are brought in. Is Darren there? Uh, yep, so in terms of the capacity, uh, Patrick has already out outlined there that this is merely an enhancement in terms of the tools that we have available to us uh, in terms of tackling the money of uh, those that are perpetrating the most harm uh, across our communities. So the capacity currently exists. However, there will be some matters in terms of training uh, and education, and we will manage that internally through our college. We'll manage some of that with, uh, along with the Department of Justice. And we'll also reach out to our uh, partners in the National Crime Agency to assist us with that as well, so to ensure that we are joined up around that. Okay, so you don't see a massive step up then in, in demand for your on, on workload as a result of this? In terms of demand, uh, and I think I've gone on record before as saying that uh, we fluctuate between 80 to 120 organised crime groupings that we investigate across the country. So we do have a system of prioritisation, and as I say, there are a variety of offences and legislation that we bring to bear in tackling that crime that's being perpetrated. So uh, this will simply be one other consideration that we will have, and as I say, key in this is our ability to refer these matters to our partners uh, in the NCA, who obviously will be at the forefront in terms of much of what we're talking about here today. You're saying you have about 80 to 120 organised crime groups that you're hopefully on top of, within, that's within Northern Ireland just? That's purely within Northern Ireland, yes. It's quite surprising the number, but I suppose it's for the, the ordinary person in the street, they're not aware of really the extent of all of this, and it's, I think it's to be welcomed, and the sooner it's implemented, the better. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Any other members? Any questions? Yes, Sinead Bradley. Yes, Sinead. Come on, go on Thank ahead. you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to ask, in terms of future-proofing this, um, because I appreciate the Act can't be changed at this time, but it is about commencing the provisions that are allowed for, under that Act. In those provisions, um, is there a potential weakness, given that we are an island, 
Is there a potential weakness that any movable assets could simply be moved across the border? And also, is there the possibility um, that I imagine data sharing on a global, if not certainly a national scale, is critical um, to taking any leads on this? It, or has it been Brexit proofed? And how, how strong is this tool or in our box in the event of data shutdown um, following the Brexit? Not sure who wants to. <laughs> I don't know whether um, Patrick wants to come in in terms of the Brexit proofing. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a UK act. It it allows for the sharing of information and in terms of the movable assets, the um, the freezing the the freezing of assets should stop that from happening. And this is an enhanced tool that enables that to happen. I I don't know about the Brexit, Andrea. Have we any ex the exit? Well, uh, I to future proofing, we, we, we of course are still uh, in a, in a post-Brexit transitional uh, period where uh, a lot of the existing relationships that we have with other jurisdictions and law enforcement in other jurisdictions um, are, are still very strong and I suppose it's just now finding uh, new accommodations. The, the reality is that it's always going to be the case that, that uh, money particularly will move around the world and, and, and now with the advent of cryptocurrencies etc can do so at an alarming rate. Um, if if uh, assets uh, can be frozen uh, in this jurisdiction, then that's what law enforcement will seek to do. If they, the asset is now outside the jurisdiction, uh, then uh, the, the effort would be to try and collaboratively work with that jurisdiction to freeze the asset in that jurisdiction. Um, really, the common goal should be the, um, the, the removal and denial of the asset from the criminal. And whether that is achieved by law enforcement in this jurisdiction or law enforcement in another jurisdiction uh, is perhaps a, a, a different conversation. Uh, the objective should be to remove the asset. I certainly know that, that in relation to um, our partnership with, with uh, Angarda Shikana and uh, with the Criminal Assets Bureau, uh, we have very strong uh, working relationships there. Um, the the, uh, the Republic of Ireland have, uh, albeit not the same, they have an analogous non-conviction based uh, asset forfeiture uh, legislation uh, that they can rely upon and uh, it really is a question of, of trying to, to have that uh, collaborative approach and um, sharing um, uh, investigative strategies to ensure that and actually that, that, that we work towards a, a singular outcome which is tackling um, a, a, a scourge that respects uh, neither border nor sea nor Brexit. I don't know whether Karen would, would have any further thoughts on that. Yeah, if I can just come in behind that as well. So just to give some assurance in terms, particularly the cross-border cooperation, that's managed under the auspices of the Joint Agency Task Force, uh, whereby on Garda Shikana, uh, CAB, Revenue Commissioners, ourselves, NCA and HMRC sit. So we do readily share information. We do conduct cross-border joint investigations, and there is uh, many examples of the success from that cooperation. So just to give that assurance. Okay, Sinead. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I still have a concern because, um, like, I can understand the need for this to come through. You know, we need legislative powers to put any teeth to anything, and yet. The fact that we're an island um, is, in, in this regard, unless it has sufficient legal tie-up, um, we're, we're relying on goodwill and good relationships, um, which is far from an ideal situation in terms of really tackling it. So thank you. Okay. Any other members? No. Um, okay. Well, I think that's... There was one I had actually, the, the briefing paper indicated the Minister had written round the executive of her intention. Have, has she got a response to say from an executive perspective? At this point I'm not aware of her response, no, I didn't double check that and today we hadn't had any response yet. Okay, um, and has the policing board or 
raised any issues in respect of the commencement of the provisions? No. Okay. Um, that's, I'm aware. that's okay. Sorry. <coughs> Linda, I yeah. Um, have the policing board, has this been brought to the full policing board, are you aware? Well, I know, um, was it brought, to, sorry, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to claim I have been in the department three weeks, so I'm going to refer to Andrea. You're doing well. <laughs> I, I was going to pull that out as an excuse at one point, so I'm using it now. No need. <laughs> so the department, uh, the minister did not write to the policing board at the time that she wrote the letter to you last Friday, Chair, and to um, the executive members. Um, so, uh, there's been no formal um, consultation. I know the um, the UWO provisions have come up in discussions with um, PSNI, a policing board, um, but I don't believe there's been any direct f formal consultation with I the board. I know it is something that we had as a policing board taken uh, quite an interest in, and in fairness, had had a number of conversations with PSNI, and, and as I said, Darren was involved in, in some of that. So it, I think it would certainly be worth having their view on it. Unless um, Darren, unless Darren's aware of anything from the policing board's perspective. I'm really going to have to apologise, but that last bit of the conversation was really uh, broken up. Uh, it's just Darren, uh, in terms of the whether or not you're aware of the policing board has had a view expressed in respect of it, that that's really just what we're after. Sorry, Chair, and yes, in between having a fire alarm going off in the background here as well. So, uh, yeah, I believe there have been conversations uh, and as being highlighted there, there have been briefing sessions, and particularly to the Performance Board, uh, with regards to this part of uh, potential new legislation as well. So, I believe they are aware. I, I can't comment in terms of their viewpoint around it. No, that's, that's fair enough. Come back to it. Yeah, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I suppose what we can, the committee can discuss it in terms of what, what our general view is on it, but um, I know from my, from my own perspective, you know, I very much welcome what we're trying to do here, but there, there are just some procedural things that I would like to see ironed out so that we know exactly what our role is and information. So I, I would like to have a letter to say this is what the Department of Justice is responsible for. These are the commencement regulations that we mm -hmm. will be tabling and the affirmative resolution process mm -hmm. and how, what, what that relates to by way of the legislation. And I would like to see then what the Home Secretary mm -hmm. is going to be specifically responsible for commencing. Uh, and in that respect, if there's no established protocol around this, the mechanism beyond just an informal conversation with this committee, what's the mechanism to get a, a more formal view Albeit, given this scenario we face, it's non-binding. The Home Secretary and so on can obviously commence uh, if they have the legal authority to do it. But if we have even a consultative role, what does that look like? Um, and, and I raise that, setting aside the substantive issue here to do with the, these the, this piece of legislation, it would set a precedent for other aspects if we came back to it as an assembly. Uh, and so I would like to make sure that we get the procedure right on this because if there is no established protocol then we'll be setting a precedent that may be an aspect of a, another department yeah I, I don't know whether there this is um p apart from copo and this i'm not sure that it, it is a, a, a an issue anywhere else and um what we're trying to do is say well when in the absence of an established protocol and procedure predetermined protocol or procedure what is a proportionate and um, you know pragmatic way to deal with this and to get us to the point where we would have been if a legislative consent motion had been in you know procedurally finalized in the assembly so I suppose chair I'm just trying to get a sense of is it that you want that in advance of you know anything progressing on on the commencement well, more detail well, listen we, 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 we can move on it. You know, the committee will turn this around very quickly, but um, I, I would just like to have it spelled out in more detail. The DOJ specific responsibility, <coughs> commencement regulations, and the Home Secretary's commencement regulations, and, and how that relates. 
to this aspect of the the legislation that, that has mm-hmm. it's if if the home secretary is commencing what are devolved issues yes then i think mla is rightly are asking what does that relate to and I can understand why we don't have a rule because there was no assembly and we missed the LCM, which would have been the normal process. Mm-hmm. But is there a way that we can give an opinion to the before the Home Secretary commences these regulations, whether that's taken into your, into account legally? I suspect it doesn't need to be, but I think it would be worth exploring. Um, are we able to, to give a view on that that can be informative, if nothing else? Mm-hmm. And I think we need to look at... How, What's the mechanism for expressing that? Is it a simple expression of this committee, a letter from the committee? What normally would have been an affirmative vote in the assembly mm-hmm. is the optimum, um, but that may not. That that obviously is not something that we can do. So, um, yeah. So, and is it in terms of the um, all of the provisions? Um, because a lot of the provisions were, were listed in the LCM, but there are some provisions that, as the passage, as the bill went through. Um, they wouldn't have been considered in the previous LCA, or the, the memorandum, the draft memorandum that was drafted at the time. Mm-hmm. So would it be helpful for us to set out for the committee uh, you know, all of the processes that went through, where the approvals were, and for the provisions that weren't originally considered? That, that, that would be helpful, yes. But what, what, I, what, what I'll do, Cathy, um, we'll talk it around the committee members. Mm-hmm. I'll write back as chair of the committee to say, here's what the committee would like. Um, in terms of information to allow the committee then to express a view on it. Um, you know, I personally am content that we proceed, but I still would like some clarification on, on some of these things. Um, you know, in principle, of course, I want this to happen, but I just think there's a few issues we need to bottom out um, before I would feel, I might be speaking out of turn, all the members feel comfortable to give an opinion right now. So... I'm content that we leave it at that and the committee will explore this a bit further and then we'll write to the department. Okay. All right. Get back to you on that. Okay, members. Okay, can I can I thank everyone f- in terms of our witnesses that came forward? I very much appreciate that. Thank you. And Cathy, I wish you well in your new role. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. So far. Well, yes, it's very interesting. and um, Well done. We'll get back to you as quickly as possible on those issues. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Darren and Patrick are you're at liberty to dial out of the call. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Take care. Thank you. Um So members, I'm not sure if I some of the comments I made, if that is a way forward for us, um, I'm happy to, to take views on it. Maybe Christine, do you have any? There were some of the aspects of that that came forward that I that I didn't see in any of the papers, particularly what the Home Office is going to be responsible for and what the Department of Justice here is responsible for by way of commencement. Um, I think if it's helpful, we'll draft a letter. And I um, as you outlined, asking them to set out very specifically which provisions the Home Office are required to commence and which provisions the DOJ are required to commence um, and what role the Assembly has in relation to the DOJ, in other words, what procedure it requires um, and also what mechanism there would be for the Committee to express their views on the provisions the Home Office are going to be asked to commence before they go ahead. Um, I think, rightly so, the Home Office, if the Minister indicates she wants them to commence, can go ahead, but we can look for some mechanism to feed in. Um, I think this feeds into a later um, agenda item as well, because there's another one um, later on in the agenda, mm-hmm. um, where the Minister is intending to direct the Home Office to commence as well. Um, so we can do that. Um, do you want us to ask for... The, the department to give us the views or any the views of the policing board as well because that was mentioned yeah I know they Andrea mentioned that we've had no response yet from executive colleagues and also um, the policing board so. I would be inclined to ask the policing board directly 
can't do that rather than go through the Sorry, Chair. Yep. Sorry, Sinead. Sorry, Chair. I hope I'm not talking over anybody because I'm really struggling to hear at this point. Right. Um, but I, I am very mindful that, um, and, and this may be what you're discussing, but I'm very mindful that um, this does seem to be a new mechanism for retrospectively bringing in an LCM. Um, and as such, I'd like to know, you know, has, it, has this happened before or has there been any other mechanisms or um, retrospective tools used for similar consequence? I'm not aware of any, Sinead. Um, it, it is quite unique because in normal circumstances, there would obviously be the LCM. Um, and once it becomes an act, we can't put it through as an LCM. It, it, we can't use that process. Um, I know there has been ongoing discussions between um, the assembly officials here, um, the executive office officials, etc., cetera, um, to have a look at this particular scenario because um, it is fairly unique as far as we are concerned. I mean, I think originally the department was talking or calling it an LCM, but it, it cannot be an LCM because you're, an LCM is seeking legislative consent to put through a piece of legislation that has already passed the post, so it can't be an LCM. So I think this is the, the mechanism that they've obviously come up with where they were going to brief the committee and the minister has written to executive colleagues um, and then the right to the Home Office. But I think from the committee's perspective, it would be helpful for us to get it set out exactly who's commencing which provisions um, and also the provisions that are going to go through here and any of the codes of practice that um, will have to be changed and amended. If that's all set out so that you can very clearly see what ones you will have to deal with here and what ones will go through via the Home Office and then we can ask the Department can there be a mechanism for the committee to feed in their views on those provisions going through the Home Office. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Sinead. It's, it's, it's uh, the point I was making earlier, you know, that I accept this is very unique, but it will set a precedent and you never know what circumstance and what piece of legislation it may relate to. Uh, hopefully it never does because we should have this place up and running and, and we give our consent through the, the normal process. But I think we're better trying to get this one right now because it'll be informative if it ever happened again in the future. And, and I'm just not sure if the answer myself as to what the best mechanism is to allow the democratic expression of the Assembly um, in terms of retrospectively applying these provisions that the Home Secretary is able to put down commencement regulations for. Um, so I don't have all the answers to that, but I do think we need to, to be raising it. And it, maybe not just with the, the Department for Justice, it may be something that needs to be raised with the executive office, um, because you probably need to set a precedent that has collective buy-in across the executive as well. Um, so if, if, if members are content, we'll raise this with the, the executive office um, and the, the kind of dilemma that it's putting the committee in, um, and, and we'll, we'll lay that out by way of a letter, and, and we, we'll come back to this as soon as we can get some responses to it. Okay, Chair. Okay. If members are content, we'll proceed then on that basis and um, we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay. Okay. Sorry, if members bear with me now, we've quite a bit of business still to get through, but hopefully relatively straightforward. The next item that we had to deal with was the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill and the initial proposals for oral evidence, um, pages 81 through to 168 of your meeting pack. Um, the closing date for written submissions on the committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill is Friday the 5th of June. The timetable um, agreed by the committee provided for oral evidence sessions to commence on Thursday the 11th of June. It's proposed to start oral evidence sessions on the bill by inviting both Women's Aid Federation and the Men's Advisory Project to give evidence at our meeting on the 11th of June. Um, proposals for other oral evidence sessions to be scheduled on the bill will be uh, provided to the committee for consideration 
at that meeting on the 4th. Um, so if, if members are content for both oral evidence sessions to be scheduled for the 11th of June. And also just to say, members, there was correspondence from Derry and Straban District Council wanting to seek an extension for their written evidence to the 11th of June. And um, I'm content that we, we allow that and that then will be applied to other organisations if they request it. Linda? I agree with that. Also, um, it was raised with me by a project that is based in Derry, La Dolce Vita, that they have spoken to the department on a number of occasions and asked to be... Their, their project that works with uh, victims of domestic violence and abuse and they have said that they have they have asked repeatedly to be put on the list of consultees around anything to do with, with, with these issues and they are repeatedly not put on that list so can we write to the minister and ask her that she put them on the list yeah. for her department um, to be one of the, the stakeholders or, or main consultees in relation to any issues around not just this bill, but anything in relation to the, the topic of domestic and sexual violence. Yeah, well, I'm happy with that, Rachel. Yeah, just to follow on from that as well, I know um, I had written just on behalf of two organisations to be added on, but just in future, the likes of here and I and Car Friend, who do operate um, support systems for people and to give support and advice for um, people who are victims of domestic violence and abuse, just for them to be added on to any future correspondence as well so I think there just seems to be a little bit of a gap in the department list um, of, of statutory consultees and organisations just if, if those two could be added on as well yeah no problem okay okay um, the department members just on this topic has written providing further information on the issues that were raised at our oral evidence session on the bill at the meeting on the 2nd of April and also during the second stage debate and the issues uh, covered included the scope of abusive behaviour, the defence provision, um, parental alienation and the robustness of the legislation. So um, it's just by way of noting that that additional information um, has been there for members. It'll be added to the electronic bill pack for future uh, reference. Um, item nine is the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill, pages 13 to 20 in respect of the committee's consideration of the LCM um, for agreement at the meeting today. The draft report was provided to members by email on Tuesday. Um, any typographical or formatting errors in the report will be amended at the briefing stage before being circulated to MLAs and published on the committee web page. Um, and if there's any uh, proposed amendments to the draft report, then now's the time to do it. Otherwise, I'll take you through the formal part of the process. Um, front page contents page and membership page. Are members content that the front page contents page and membership page stand part of the report? Agreed? Agreed. Uh, are, mom, are members content that the background section of paragraphs 1 to 4 stand part of the report? Agreed. Are members content paragraphs 5 and 6 which outline the purpose of the legislative consent motion stand part of the report. Agreed. Agreed. Are members content that paragraph 7 to 15, which detail the committee's consideration of the LCM, stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed yeah. Are members content that the conclusion section at paragraph 16 stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed. Are members content that the appendices stand part of the report? Agreed. Agreed. Um, members um, can agree that I I'll clear the draft minutes of today's meeting for it to be included in Appendix 6 and that will enable the report to be finalised and then the draft minutes will be replaced by the final version of the minutes once they are agreed by the next meeting of the committee. Members content? Agreed. Uh, members content that the report is published on the committee's web page and issued to all MLAs? Agreed. Agreed, yeah. Um, members, committee staff will notify um, members when a date for the debate on the LCM then has been scheduled. So thank you for that. Uh, item 10 is the LCM on air traffic management and unmanned aircraft bill. At our meeting of the 14th of May, the committee considered a written briefing paper that outlined proposals to extend provisions relating to unlawful use of drones near custodial institutions in the air traffic management and unmanned air aircraft bill to Northern Ireland by way of an LCM, and members agreed that an oral briefing um, or any other information was not required. The department led the LCM on the 22nd of May and understanding order 42A 
The committee now has up to 15 days to complete its report to the Assembly. So if members are content with the proposal to extend uh, these provisions in the Air Traffic Management and Unmanned Aircraft Bill relating to the interference with unmanned aircraft, otherwise known as drones, over places of detention to Northern Ireland by way of the LCM, then we can proceed with getting a report prepared. Chair, sure, that doesn't mean that they have to be registered then, does it? All drones? No, it, it related to the uh, taking taking down of them primarily around yeah. drones at these institutions. Just specific to these areas, just the, the institutions, airports, etc. We can ask. Yeah. I'm just offhand. I know it was an issue that we had looked at before around what was included in it. Are you wanting to hold it back until we get that answer? Well, no, go ahead, but we'll get more detail on it. We'll get that. Yeah, just get clarification on it, please. Around the registration of the yeah. institutions? Yeah, and the drones themselves, are they, do, do they have to be controlled? I don't think so. I had one went over my head the other day and I thought, I wonder who's behind that. <laughs> <laughs> it's out for my daily walk. Again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, then we'll, we'll proceed, members, in terms of um, pulling together um, a report for it. Um, but we'll, we'll ask that question as well and we can have that response um, for the committee. Item 11, the Attorney General for Northern Ireland draft human rights guidance for the PPS and the PSNI on application of Section 5 of the Criminal Law Act um, in respect of victims of serious sexual offences and those to whom they make disclosure. The uh, relevant pages are in your meeting pack of 184 to 201. Um, the Attorney General is required under Section 8 of the Justice Act uh, 2004 to issue guidance to named criminal justice organisations on the exercise of their functions in a manner that's consistent with international human rights standards and to fulfil that requirement the AG periodically issues tailored guidance which is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly and the Attorney General provides a copy of the draft guidance to the Justice Committee for its consideration. The AG has provided a copy of the draft guidance that's been prepared um, in respect of this issue to those organisations and it has been um, prepared following recommendations that are in the Gillen Review that the AG should give additional guidance covering serious sexual offences in the absence of repeal of Section 5 of the Act and that will replace the limited human rights guidance that was issued to PPS in May 2019. And the Attorney General's Office has liaised with both the PPS and the PSNI in preparation of the guidance and in consultation with the Advocate General for Northern Ireland um, is also underway. Um, so members, it's to seek your view as to whether you're content with the draft guidance or whether it would be helpful to request information um, in respect of the views of the PPS and the PSNI. Um, Linda? I'm content with it, but just um, in relation to ensuring that the PPS and PSNA are aware of it, um, that is that uh, obviously they've already said that he's liaised with those two organisations, which is what, what you would expect, but it's an ensuring, as in all of these things, that the people who are dealing with the issues understand the guidance, because that's what they so often find in, in any of these issues, particularly in my dealings with the, the PSNA on some issues, it's just not understanding fully the guidance. And, and I suppose that's a job, to be fair, for the PSNA, but I mean, it is a job, I think, for the Attorney General to ensure that they are doing that mm -hmm. when he issues guidance. That and nor normally, members in the past, um, the Attorney General would come to the committee to outline because the negative resolution procedure uh, ultimately. Any member can put down a prayer of annulment to try and stop it. Um, and because of the rules, the Office of Attorney General doesn't have a right to actually engage in debates in the Assembly if that ever happens. So the committee has usually taken evidence from the Attorney General. Um, and so those are questions that we, we could put to them by way of what the PPS and PSNI response was. But our members are content that we, we seek that information from the PPS, PSNI what their response is, 
and then we schedule um, a future meeting where the Attorney General, before this is laid, can talk the committee through what, what's being proposed. Great. Right. Sure, just Rachel. additionally, this also mentions um, those that are dealing with um, social security applications as well. So, would there be room for um, asking if there's been you know, sufficient conversation had with the Department of Communities and Capita? Yeah. Um, just, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Maybe it's just my reading of it. It's not overly clear if that has happened. Um, obviously, it would be up to the PPS and PSNI to to deal with that, but just in terms of the dissemination of guidance to DFC and, and Capita, specifically to NPIP, um, would just seek some more clarification on that. Okay. Christine, can you look at... Pardon? Can you look at that issue as to where it interfaces with the oh. Department for Communities around what Rachel has mentioned, and yeah. we can include that then in the correspondence? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. Item 12, um, Functioning of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, um, pages 203 to 240. The committee received a range of papers in relation to the justice-related provisions of this bill from the Committee for Finance, Department of Justice and the bill sponsor, Jim Alistair MLA, and at the meeting on the 30th of April, the committee agreed to request a copy of the response from the Permanent Secretary. Um, of the Department of Justice, Peter May, uh, to the bill sponsor's letter dated 29th of April, and that has now been received. The Department of Justice responsibilities relate to the offences and penalties of the aspects of the bill which are covered in Clause 9 and 11. Clause 9 making it a criminal offence to use anything other than departmental systems and emails accounts when communicating in <coughs> government business and creates a maximum penalty of two years imprisonment. A defence of reasonable excuse is provided in the clause. Clause 11 makes it a criminal offence for a minister, special adviser or civil servant to pass confidential or commercially sensitive information for the benefit of anyone else and creates a maximum penalty of five years imprisonment. The clerk's paper summarises the views and comments of the Department of Justice, the Minister of Finance, on behalf of the Executive and the Bill sponsor, uh, Jim Allister, from correspondence that has been uh, received. Um, so it's whether members um, wish to submit any views or comments in respect of the Committee of, for Finance on the justice-related provisions in the bill. Paul, I'm not sure if you're still on the line. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I was just about to declare an interest as being a member of the Finance Committee also, which is scrutinising this. Um, yeah, I, I read through the report from McClark, and yeah, it's fair enough, I think. We're all questioning, um, including the author of the bill, uh, the tariffs set down and also the, the scope uh, uh, of Clause 9 and Clause 11. Uh, they, they are the two clauses that has the tariffs, the, that creates the offence. Uh, and also, I think there's a nervousness around uh, Clause 9 with regards to electronic communications for business use, whereby... There may be mistakes made where you would have a number of email accounts on one device and you just happen to send an email from the wrong email address, which is, I'm sure, every single person, human being that has a smartphone has done that in the past. So it's about getting some sort of reasonable de defence uh, put into that too. Um, I'm aware that I don't really want to talk too much on it because I'll not be able to relay all the concerns and fears and beliefs of the Finance Committee, but I suppose that's... What I've addressed there is probably where I'm at personally in the scrutiny of it, uh, and I'm sure other members of the Justice Committee would want to add to that. Well, I suppose from from our, our the perspective of the Justice Committee, the the merits or otherwise of the intention behind the bill is not really for the committee to take a view on. That'll be for the the Committee for Finance, as I see it. Where, however, there are offences flowing from any legislation that may be passed. Then we want to make sure that you know they're 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 clearly defined and and spelled out in legislation. So you know that that would be my own view that the committee could go back to the committee for finance, indicating that if it decides to proceed, that any offences need to be clearly defined, unambiguous in their intention, and that the penalties are proportionate, getting in with overall sentencing framework around criminal law. That would just be a, a generic response that I don't think 
gives a, a view on the part of this committee as to whether or not it supports the principle behind it. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Linda? It's probably... I mean, I think absolutely the tariffs are excessive, particularly given that I use my own personal email for everything because I never wanted to change my email so that people would have access to me and I wouldn't lose access to them. So for, for me, and, and I'm not .com, so I'm not good at this stuff and I would definitely be the person who'd make the mistake. But I, a lot of this is already covered in terms of the, the bill that was brought forward or the stuff that was brought forward in the codes of conduct. So, I mean, I think you've already said, sure, it's not for us to decide what on the merits of the bill, so I'm, I'm not going to get into that. But I know that um, Peter May had, had responded to, and was that to the Finance Committee or was that just to Jim Allister around these clauses? And outlined that, that, that it is covered. It's, it's actually unnecessary because it's covered. Just to Peter, or just in terms of series, yeah, there's been a series of correspondence between. Yeah. But my understanding is the finance committee have all of it. Okay, fair enough. Well, look, that's. I'm going to leave it for the finance committee to worry about it. We only yeah. have to worry about our, our part of it. Well, are, are members content that, without prejudice to expressing a view, that you know that that, that principle around it being clearly defined, unambiguous, and fitting into the overall sentencing framework is something that needs to be given cognizance by the Committee for Finance's deliberation uh, and we avoid expressing a view either way as to what this committee's position is on the, the actual bill. Great. Yeah. Yeah, great. Leave, leave it to me and Dan. We we'll sort it out. <laughs> Happy to do that, Paul. Why have you not got it sorted out already then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, item 13. The... Uh, Crime Act 2019 creates a new standalone legal regime for UK law enforcement agencies and prosecuting authorities to obtain electronic data directly from overseas communication service providers for the purposes of criminal investigations and prosecution. Uh, the Act extends to Northern Ireland and it contains devolved provisions that have not yet been commenced. The Justice Minister is of a view that there is a sound and justifiable case for relevant provisions within the Act to be commenced for Northern Ireland. If not extended, it would leave the police and other law enforcement bodies in a detrimental position in relation to their ability to seek the timely access to electronic data stored by communication service providers located overseas in the course of a criminal investigation and prosecution. Um, the bill is now enacted and therefore an LCM is not an appropriate method to apply the provisions to Northern Ireland. The Minister therefore intends to notify the Home Secretary of her agreement to commence the relevant provisions of the Crime Act in Northern Ireland and ask the Home Office to take forward the necessary regulations through Westminster. She has also notified her executive colleagues of her intention by way of a ministerial colleague's letter and in due course will issue a written statement to the Assembly. The Department is also exploring with the Office of the Lord Chief Justice and the Home Office the most appropriate procedure and likely time frame to make the required amendments to the Crown Court rules giving effect to the legislation in Northern Ireland. So, that same mechanism. Hmm. Which I thought was only unique and rare. This was obviously passed 2019 uh, at a time when there was no assembly. So, therefore, introducing the LCM to do this is the problem. Yeah. Same situation as the previous one. Do we have a suggestion that our action then is the same, you know, particularly in relation to the views of the executive? I mean, obviously the minister said she's written to her executive colleagues, but we don't know what their view of it is. And so that this is exactly the same as, as the other issue. Whatever is the answer to one is the answer to the other, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, like uh, on the face of it, the intent and the principle behind this legislation, I, I have no difficulty with. Mm -hmm. It just raises those same issues that we we talked about earlier. Can we also try to find out if we do put in place this mechanism? Are there likely to be any 
more of these to come forward yeah. that we don't know about that we aren't aware of and and for me that's across the board so that's not just for this committee but for the assembly as a whole i'm, I'm really not content that the northern ireland office is responsible for producing regulations which you know we now have an assembly up and running that we should be able to, to deal with either you know, by way of an urgent emergency legislative procedure that allows us to put through the primary legislation. Um, you know, it, I, I, I would like to know why that isn't possible. You know, because contracting out our democratic responsibility in a devolved assembly is not something that the devolutionist sits comfortably with me. So we'll, 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 yeah, okay. We'll raise that and see what the response is whenever we come back. I would like to include, is there the, the ability to put this through the assembly? Because even if it's a simple copy, cut and paste, it would allow us to carry out some kind of scrutiny role and give democratic validity, validity to it as opposed to one minister being able to determine whether or not something should be commenced and applied. Okay. Sorry, Chairman, just before we go on, can I go back to the response to um, Mr Alistair's bill? Is the committee content that we copy the response to the Department of Justice and Mr Alistair, just for information? Yes. Great. should have included that. Okay, well then we'll deal with item 13 in the same way as the issue around the uh, Criminal Finance Act. Um, we'll add into that letter what, what is stopping the department from putting forward, even if it's urgent emergency legislation, to allow the Assembly to, to deal with this. Um, is that something that could be considered? And we'll include in that in writing to the First and Deputy First Minister that this is another example, which is creating a an issue when it comes to how we can consider this type of matter. Okay, um, item 14 is the in-year June monitoring round. Um, RAISE has provided a paper to assist committees with the scrutiny of in-year monitoring rounds, detailed guidance from the Department of Finance to all departments, including forms to be used in their monitoring round submissions has also been provided for. Um, the forms are more detailed than those previously used and it covers a range of areas including the bids made, the prioritisation of bids, reduced requirements, proposed allocations and reductions and reclassifications and any technical transfers. Um, so if members are content, we'll request copies of the completed in-year monitoring round forms for the June 2020 monitoring round that has been submitted to the Department of Finance from the Department of Justice and information that's outlined in paragraph 5 of the Senior Assistant Clerk's paper at page 252 of the uh, meeting pack. Read, yep. Read. Chair, can I come in there? Yeah. Uh, th this is a unique situation we're in. I spoke about this a wee bit in the House this week. Uh, th these, these monitoring rounds are so important now. We, we have a two vote in accounts. We, uh, we don't have the main estimates for this year's budget. That's not going to appear until September, if, if it is going to appear. Uh, so there's money moving about, and of course with an influx of 1. Uh, uh, 1.2 billion, I think it is, uh, Barnet Consequential. So there's money moving about here, uh, and we'll have to ensure as best we can as a scrutiny committee that the Justice Department are getting enough money and also doing enough to spend that money effectively and efficiently. Um, and there can be no secrets. We've already had what I would class as a, a bad number of weeks with the department over finance. And that shouldn't be because ultimately these facts and figures, they're pound signs and pence, and they really should be defined. So uh, I think we, we will need to take in your morning very, uh, uh, but look at it on, it on it very importantly over the over the June period and then all the, the other monitoring rounds to ensure that we, we spend this money efficiently and effectively, but also that we can finance the recovery plan and see what the Department of Justice is doing differently 
and maybe not spending money on, and then seeing how that could be used for a better use then. Yeah. No, I, I'm content with that. The, the Clark's paper outlined a number of areas for you know the kind of detail we need around COVID-19 internal reallocations. Um, you know, and it, it, it spells out some more information that we want beyond what's in the raised paper. So I, I agree with what you've said that we need to get that type of information. Um, our members content then that when we get a copy of that information from the Department of Justice, we'll share it with the Committee for Finance. Um, and to raise that have helped with the, the templates um, and obviously we'll have our briefing session on the 4th of June Great. I agreed correspondence, there's five items of correspondence um, I'll draw attention to, to some of them um, there's a response from the chairperson's liaison group the committee's letter asking uh, the CLG to consider how members non-attendance at committee meetings um, are handled to assist with the compliance around social distancing and CLG is going to consider that matter at a future meeting and then we'll, we'll write again to the committee. Um, one item in the table pack is the Criminal Justice Inspection uh, Corporate Plan, Business Plan and Inspection Programme. Um, it's there for members' information. Members content then to action the other items as outlined in the cover sheet. Great. 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 Um, I don't have any other chairman's business. Is there any other business for members? Okay, then our next meeting will be on the 4th of June and members will be advised of the time and the room in due course. Um, thank you, members, for your patience today. The Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.